Mr. Williams and hopefully having some conversations with some other people in the department, will conclude that uh, before he came on as secretary, uh, things took place in the department that should not have. And uh, as I say, if, 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 if there is no problem, uh, it, 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 it's, the problem is when you try to, to fix it. Okay? Thank you very, very much for your participation. The, um, let me, for the, for the record, you may leave at this point if you like. Yeah, Mr. Gladio? Yes, thank you all, all thank of you. you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hobson has indicated that he wanted to vote no by proxy. Let me put that in for the record. The subcommittee will stand in recess until 3 p.m. on Thursday, March 21, or until such other time as the chair shall announce. The subcommittee now stands in recess. For more information about this hearing, you may contact the House Government Operations Subcommittee at B372 Rayburn Office Building in Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20515. Coming up in just a moment, a hearing concerning the Cable Television Consumer Protection and Competition Act of 1991. Good day from Washington. You're watching C-SPAN 2. We're taking a short break now to update our schedule for the next several hours, but first this reminder. For the most up-to-date program information for C-SPAN 2 and our companion network C-SPAN, call the C-SPAN scheduled hotline. The number is area code 202-628-2205. Looking ahead, Next, a hearing examining the Cable Television Consumer and Competition Act of 1991. The House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee called the hearing Wednesday to take testimony from mayors and others who support the bill. After that, we will turn to an interview focusing on National Guard and reserve issues and difficulties between employers and employees in the military. The guest is G. Andrew Lawrence, Executive Director of the National Commission for Employer Support of the Guard and Reserve. At 6.15 a.m. Eastern Time, it's a hearing on police brutality in this country. The House Judiciary Subcommittee held the hearing Wednesday to take testimony from a Justice Department official, a representative of the ACLU, and others. And following that, we will bring you live coverage of the United States Senate. Senators are expected to take up consideration of the nomination of former Florida Governor Bob Martinez to be director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. That's the U.S. Senate, live at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time, Thursday. And that's a look at the C-SPAN 2 schedule at this hour. From the Halls of Parliament in London, England, C-SPAN brings you the British House of Commons, and with it, common sense. For an inside look at the proceedings of England's Legislative Congress, Common Sense provides you with an overview of the powers of Parliament and examines the role of the Queen. You'll discover what members do in a typical day, how a bill becomes a law, and the history of television coverage in the chambers. Common Sense also gives you a handy guide to terms of valuable reference. To order your copy, send a check or money order for $3 to C-SPAN Common Sense, 400 North Capitol Street, 
Suite 650, Washington, D.C., 20001. Energy and Commerce Subcommittee called the hearing Wednesday to take testimony from mayors and others who support the parts of the legislation that will protect consumers from alleged local cable television problems. Among those speaking before the committee were Mayor Kurt Schmoke of Baltimore, Mayor Sharp James of Newark, New Jersey, and Alfred Sykes, the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. Good morning. Today the subcommittee begins consideration of H.R. 1303, the Cable Television Consumer Protection and Competition Act of 1991. <clears throat> Legislation designed to increase competition in the video programming marketplace and to protect consumers from unreasonable practices by cable operators. H.R. 1303 is virtually identical to H.R. 5267 which was developed by the subcommittee last year through a bipartisan process and which passed this subcommittee, the Energy and Commerce Committee, and the House of Representatives on unanimous voice votes. In the months since this subcommittee last considered cable legislation, there have been two significant changes. First, the rates cable operators charge consumers have risen even higher, with cable rates rising nationally 13 percent last year, more than double the overall rate of inflation. Second, potential competition to cable has foundered. In particular, Sky Cable, which was widely proclaimed to be the most likely near-term prospect for strong competition to cable, is off to a stumbling start if it hasn't ceased to a dead halt. But that's not surprising. Since the early 1980s, promises of competition to cable have been forecast but never realized. Somehow competition to cable always manages to loom just over the horizon. As a result, consumers still are faced with the worst of all possible worlds. They are unprotected from the unreasonable behavior of cable operators by either competition or regulation. <clears throat> Our first priority must be to bring true competition to cable. It is evident that developing such competition will require legislation. It, it will also require time. And during that period where cable remains an unregulated monopoly, until competition to cable actually exists, we must provide adequate regulatory protection for consumers. It is my desire and intention to work in a spirit of bipartisan cooperation to develop a consensus bill. Let there be no doubt, though, that it is my intention to produce a cable bill from this subcommittee expeditiously. There have been some suggestions that the subcommittee should delay further action on this legislation until the FCC completes its pending rulemaking on effective competition. I would like to explain briefly why that is not a viable or acceptable option. First, the Commission's proceeding will in no way remedy the true problems in the video marketplace. The Commission's effective competition proceeding may craft a new definition of competition but will not result in alternative competitive options for consumers. The principal focus of any curative activities of the Congress or the Commission should be to promote competition not just re-regulation. I find it curious that those persons and interests who are most critical of this subcommittee's efforts to craft legislation on the basis that such legislation will be too re-regulatory are almost always the same persons and interests who suggest that Congress should wait for the Commission to complete a process that is totally re-regulatory. 
That leads me to suspect that the true concern of some critics is not regulation per se, but of regulation that would have meaningful effect against unreasonable behavior. The Commission's rulemaking process may lead to more regulation, but it will not lead to effective re regulation. Many communities likely will receive no relief under the Commission's proposal. In those communities where rates will be deregulated, only the rates for programming services most consumers can get for free will be subject to regulation. Cable operators will retain the ability to charge whatever their conscience or their debt load dictates for cable services such as CNN, ESPN, USA, TBS, Discovery, Nickelodeon, and other programming. Customer service practices and technical standards likely will be unaffected, and the inequity in the regulatory status of the broadcasting and cable industries will remain unabated. In short, the Commission's rulemaking is key to reshaping its implementation of the 1984 Cable Act. This is the underlying problem. We don't need new regulation for outdated legislation. We need new legislation for today's problems. This subcommittee has a responsibility to address these issues. We cannot and will not abrogate that responsibility. There are fundamental flaws in the 1984 Cable Act that must be remedied. We will get on with the task of effecting a true cure. Let us begin work cooperatively and productively, but let us begin the work. Let me, my time has uh, uh, expired. Let me now turn and recognize the ranking minority member, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, let me begin by saying that I agree with you and with your statement that we should work cooperatively. But I also, in my opening remarks, want to point out the difficulties that we face this year in this arena. As you know, the cable industry has been the constant focus of this subcommittee's scrutiny for the last four years. Last year, we passed legislation to correct a variety of problems chiefly rate increases and poor customer service. But the Senate could not take up the bill and it died. Now we're back in a new Congress to take a fresh look at the problems surrounding subscribers' relationship with their cable systems and what ought to be done to correct them. Last year's bill was more than just a rates and service bill. It also dealt with a variety of issues providing and affecting the competitive balance among video providers. But the subcommittee's strong interest in cable legislation stemmed from two basic consumer issues, cable rates and cable service, or service quality. Unfortunately, the industry's growing pains became apparent in the wake of the Cable Act of 1984. Cable's adjustment to a less regulatory environment caused very appropriate consumer outcries as rates rose, in some cases increased unconscionably, and service quality deteriorated in some systems. This committee's response to these problems was to work in a bipartisan manner on legislation to curb cable rate increases and improve customer service. Chairman Dingell, Chairman Markey, and I collaborated on legislation last year because we saw the opportunity for this subcommittee to take command of the debate. Last summer, it was possible for this committee in the House to produce reasonable legislation for two reasons. First, the Senate was unsure of its direction. Secondly, the administration had not formed an opinion about what kind of legislation it could support. And I think, really, I should add a third item to that analysis. There was broad support among the effective parties. We had put together a consensus among the affected people that this was the kind of bill that was needed, that they wanted, and that would serve the constituents of this subcommittee and uh, uh, others very well. We knew that we in this committee could work together to produce a bill that corrected some legitimate problems without gutting the cable industry. Now, on the other hand, the Senate bill started out as being far more regulatory mm -hmm. than ours. As the Senate tried to bring its bill to the floor, 
it became clear that the Senate bill would end up being much more regulatory than the House bill. As this year's activity already makes clear, the Senate is still moving farther away from last year's House bill, not closer to it. Now, proponents of re-regulation might say, well, that's a good thing. The stronger, the better. But unfortunately, it doesn't happen here, and it's not happening in the real world, because the administration was jolted awake last year by congressional activity. They are now working feverishly and are adamantly opposed to either the House or Senate bills, which they believe are too re-regulatory in nature. These events killed any chance for legislation last year, and this year, if we pass a bill, we've got to face reality. That bill will be vetoed by the administration, and if we don't have enough votes to override any uh, veto by the administration, we're not going to be able to put into effect any legislation. So I think we have to take a whole new look at the situation, because those events also make it impossible to believe that this committee's moderate approach to cable has any chance of surviving the legislative sausage grinder without becoming too re-regulatory. And that result only increases the likelihood that the legislation will be vetoed by the president. The chief beneficiaries of legislation, broadcasters and cable, as I pointed out earlier, are in much different positions on legislation this time around. They're opposed to it completely. Last time they were working with us. There's no sign of anyone having any interest in working with us. And I'm speaking particularly about the major players. Last year, the cable industry was willing to cooperate with Congress on a bill. Now the industry is unwilling to cooperate and is strongly opposed to anything that they consider re-regulatory in nature. Last year, broadcasters supported the bill. Now they are rethinking the future of their business. They may continue to accept must-carry provisions for the short term, but they are also interested in examining whether payment for carriage, retransmission consent, may be a better way to preserve the future of their business. They are very <coughs> concerned about the financial viability of their own businesses. Finally, the FCC's effective competition proceeding as the chairman pointed out, may not be what a lot of people on this subcommittee want, but I think regardless of that, it's going to take some of the steam out of consumer complaints by re-regulating the rates of some cable systems. All of these things make it more difficult than ever that we're going to get very far with re-regulatory re legislation. When I say very far, the ultimate goal, if you're going to do anything around here, is to get a bill signed and enacted into law. And this year, there are obstacles after obstacle that has been placed in the path of having legislation signed into law. There are impediment, there's impediment after impediment that didn't exist last year. The landscape <coughs> has changed, not a little bit, but significantly and dramatically. So I think we have to face up to the difficult situation that we're in. I also think and agree with the chairman that we're not in an unsolvable position. The committee, however, should not be wedded to last year's model purely by reflex. I think the commission will uh, address the cable rate situation this spring in a manner that perhaps will bring some relief to some consumers. But if we want to affect the market in a positive way for our constituents, I think we should begin by looking for legislative avenues that can be joined in by the Senate. It's one thing to say, pass the toughest bill possible. That's apparently the attitude of the Senate. But if they're passing it merely to get a, try and get a bill passed here in the same vein that's going to go over to the president, be vetoed, and embarrass him by, in effect, saying we're putting the president of the United States on the spot by forcing him to veto a consumer bill, I don't think it's really going to wash. If we're interested in doing our job, we've got to work in tandem with the Senate and get them to come up with a bill, and we've got to come up with a bill that can be signed and will be signed into law and will address the problems that the consumers face in this nation. So I want to say this morning that uh, I look forward to working with Chairman Markey, with all the members of this subcommittee, and hopefully we'll be able to take a fresh look at cable and a fresh approach to legislation. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. And I'd like to note uh,
that uh, today is the last hearing for Terry Haynes, who has been uh, a counsel for the minority on telecommunications um, issues over the, the last uh, several years. Uh, he has uh, provided superior uh, counsel to the um, subcommittee and to the full committee on his, uh, uh, in his uh, area of, uh, of considerable expertise. He is leaving to uh, become chief of staff for the chairman of the Federal Communications uh, Commission. Uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, there is going to be, as a result, a dramatic improvement in the quality of counsel down at the Federal Communications uh, Commission. And, uh, and I hope that, uh, uh, that uh, Terry has all of the success that he deserves in life because I think he has really uh, done a splendid job in helping us over the last uh, several years to pass every bill out of our committee on a bipartisan uh, fashion and, uh, and unanimously at that. And well, uh, this is not an area which is easy to accomplish that goal, but with Terry's uh, uh, work, uh, it has been made a lot simpler. Glad to yield to the gentleman. I just want to associate myself with uh, your remarks. He's been an invaluable uh, resource <coughs> for the members of the minority. Has certainly uh, worked very, very hard. He's been a dedicated and effective counsel. And we are certainly uh, going to miss him. But maybe by going down to the FCC, he'll solve this problem. And we won't have to take that fresh look. We won't have to worry about new legislation. And he'll be able to put into effect the kind of protections that the consumers of this nation need, want, and deserve. Terry, I certainly want to wish you the best of everything as you move down to the FCC. And we'll continue to work with you, I'm sure. My, my time has expired once again. Now, as we move to other opening statements from members of the subcommittee, let me just take a, a judicial notice of the fact that we have 27 members of the uh, subcommittee. And uh, there are very few subjects which draw the um, attention of our subcommittee members that can rival uh, the cable uh, issue. Uh, and if we are to proceed this morning in an expeditious uh, fashion, I think that it might make some sense uh, for the subcommittee members to operate under a rule which would have each with two minutes to make their opening statement, and, and then we might be able to move on to our distinguished guests uh, in a timely fashion. And without objection, we will operate under that rule for uh, the uh, balance of this morning, and we'll try to deal with each hearing on an ad hoc basis uh, determined by uh, the number of members who have an interest in that day. So let me begin by recognizing the gentleman from the state of Oklahoma, Mr. Sinar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin by commending you and the uh, leadership that you've exhibited in beginning this important debate. Two concerns. First of all, I remain concerned about the discriminatory pricing in the home satellite dish market. A good example that I could bring to you today is from a constituent of mine, Terry Kuntz, who is in Tulsa, Oklahoma who uh, pays for 36 channels on cable at the cost of $17.65. And yet just 50 miles away in his lake home, where cable will never uh, able, be able to get there, he pays for net link for only 12 channels and one premium, $20. You know, the FCC is studying, as required by the Home Satellite TV Viewing Act, uh, the bill which I helped uh, write in 88, this serious problem. That study is supposed to be released this spring, and depending on the results, it may be necessary for this committee to ensure that non-discriminatory practices in the programming industry are examined. Concern number two, we want to make sure that this legislation and all of its implications are thoroughly considered. Is forcing cable operators to re-tier in consumers' best interest? is limiting what can be done on that basic tier in the consumer's best interest. These are questions I think this committee needs to explore. If this committee, subcommittee does determine some action is necessary, we should act. This subcommittee cannot abdicate its responsibility in the area of communications law to the FCC. I join with our chairman to hope that we can reach a consensus wherever possible, and I commend him and pledge to work with him to this end. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fields. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to <coughs> yield briefly to Mr. Ritter from Pennsylvania, who has a uh, witness at the table that he'd like to introduce. I'd like to thank the gentleman from Texas for yielding. Uh, I'd like to welcome a constituent of mine, Mr. Lad Siftar, a councilman from Northampton County. 
Ladd is here testifying on behalf of the National Association of Counties. He's very well versed in this particular issue. Unfortunately, uh, I must leave as I am the ranking member on another Energy and Commerce Subcommittee dealing right now with the imminent, imminent critical issue of lust, uh, not the kind you might like to think, but leaking underground storage tanks. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> Resource Conservation and Recovery Act reauthorization. They were meeting at the same time. I, I think it's appropriate just briefly to have someone from the Lehigh Valley testify here because my district is home base to some real good cable competition where a couple of uh, cable companies are going head to head and the prices are down and the service is good and it just shows you where you have competition that you get good service and, and low price. These companies are Service Electric Cable and Twin County and they run side by side for, for many years and they're both very successful. I think competition can help promote technology it can help promote good service, and uh, unfortunately, H.R. 1303 doesn't give us that environment. It is regulatory in nature, which inhibits technology and uh, provides, I believe, uh, through rate re-regulation, disincentives for good service. I also think we should, we should own up to the fact that cable has done a super job in the last uh, years since deregulation and provided a vast array of new services and, and hopefully through the FCC deliberations we can, at those, in those marginal cases and those bad actors, in those particularly uncompetitive situations, we can have some targeted uh, regulatory approaches Jimmy. through the FCC, but I don't think we need legislation to do that. I thank the gentleman once again from Texas for yielding and yield back to him. Thank you, Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, and we will recognize now the gentleman from Texas and the gentleman from Pennsylvania's slot. Right. And in return, you will receive a undisclosed future draft pick uh, as well for moving down five spaces. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. That's right. Thank you, Chair. I'd first like to welcome my hometown mayor, Henry Felthouse, from Shelbyville, Tennessee. A good personal friend, a great person, a great mayor, and someone who has chosen at random from all the small communities in America to be our witness today. If you believe that, I've got some. Now, I'm delighted to be with you today. Um, let's get right to the bottom line. I love the number and variety of cable channels. I hate the monopolies that distribute cable to most of the 9,000 small and large communities in America. Consumers have no choice in most all communities. Consumers are forced to live with a state-sanctioned, Soviet-style system of distribution in which there's no requirement really for the cable companies to even answer the telephone to respond to consumer complaints. Groups as diverse as Consumer Federation of America and the Wall Street Journal seem to agree that consumers are being charged double of what they should be charged today for cable programming. They're paying twice as much as they should be paying if we had real competition. That's not nickels and dimes. That's about $6 billion a year of overcharges. That's billion with a B. The bottom line for Congress and the FCC is we've done nothing about it. Nothing to help the consumer. We've talked a good game. We've tried to pass legislation. But the bottom line for the folks back home is they are still paying exorbitantly high cable rates and from the sound of things today may continue to pay such rates for the foreseeable future. I hope we can change that. I support the White House call for a competition cable bill. I really thought the bill we tried to pass last year was too weak. We need to get on with this job to help consumers across America. I'm afraid that the FCC's view of its own responsibilities is so limited that consumers are fooling themselves if they think the FCC's action and proposed action under their further notice is going to do them any good at all. So let's stop this ripoff. Let's get on with the job of protecting consumers in America. Therefore, I welcome this panel. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton. I thank the chairman. I want to say I look forward to working with you on the subcommittee. I believe this is my first uh, hearing since I've been named. I want to commend you on still being on your feet after the St. Patrick's Day celebration in uh, Boston. I, I hear they have one up there. Uh, we, that's not a big holiday in Ennis, Texas for some reason. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, since I only have two minutes, uh, let me say that um, the bill that uh, you introduced last year and was passed with, uh, uh, without much debate uh, 
uh, passed because many of the industries and uh, interest groups that are affected uh, uh, were in general agreement. Uh, that's not the case this year. Uh, there is a difference of opinion amongst the uh, industries and interest groups. Uh, this year also the administration has indicated that they strongly oppose the bill that we're holding the hearing on today. Uh, I tend to think that if we want to uh, do something to uh, lower prices, as the distinguished congressman from Tennessee just talked about, uh, the answer is not more regulation, it's more competition. Uh, there are other pending bills, uh, most importantly the uh, telco entry into the cable business that would foster such competition. Uh, for those reasons, uh, uh, I look forward to a very spirited debate uh, in which uh, people that hold your views and people that hold my views uh, do what the Congress is supposed to do, and that's to debate the issue. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Okay. The gentleman's time um, has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. McMillan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, uh, my compliments for, to you for holding these hear hearings. I'd like to welcome uh, our good mayor from the great city of Baltimore, uh, Kurt Schmoke, who I think will address some of the concerns that many of us have about cable with regards to rates and customer service. Uh, many of us feel that since the 1984 deregulation bill that there have been industry practices which have not been in the consumer's best interest. And the question that we find ourselves today trying to answer is what can we do about it? Clearly, the FCC's efforts towards effective competition are a first step. But as days go by in this debate, we see the center of gravity shifting. Cable companies are now talking about phone service. Uh, lots of things uh, happening on the horizon, including the FCC's action. So I think it's very, very appropriate that we have this hearing. But one particular point that I would like to make, and I made it last year, that I think our efforts should be viewed with the objective of how we can encourage the building of our fiber optics infrastructure in this country, whether by competition or otherwise. That will ultimately be the most important issue uh, that we face as a country. Uh, and I look forward to the testimony of these uh, distinguished gentlemen. Thank you very much. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Schaefer. I uh, thank the chairman and let me uh, first express my congratulations for uh, moving the, uh, this legislation through the uh, legislative landmines of last year uh, that the full committee and the industry certainly uh, deserves credit for uh, a remarkable achievement. Although uh, that did not make it all the way, having said that, Mr. Chairman, uh, it was with some reluctance that I did not oppose last year's legislation. Although farly more tempered and much more responsible than its companion the other body, I felt 5267 went beyond the necessary fine-tuning which uh, we wanted to try to receive. And I'd like to uh, quote from the, uh, the FCC, uh, the positive results of the Cable Act were certainly not missed by the Commission. Uh, they indicated that deregulation under the Cable Act has fostered the intended results, increases in investment, with corresponding expansion of cable reach, number of subscribers, channel capacity, and new programming. And I think this is uh, something that certainly should be, uh, should be pointed out. And uh, given the uh, benefits, and uh, I understand the competition uh, situation that uh, we are all concerned with when it comes to uh, the uh, cable industry, I would just like to uh, close, uh, Mr. Chairman, and with a quote that uh, you made at a hearing last year when you said, in reference to the Cable Act, the four most difficult words for members to say is, we made a mistake. In my experience, the four hardest words to uh, come out of the Congress are, let the marketplace be. And I think that we should consider this when we uh, certainly are considering the uh, re-regulation of the uh, Cable Act. And I look forward to the testimony of the witnesses. Great. Chair, the gentleman's time has expired. The Chair will recognize the uh, gentleman from uh, Texas, Mr. Fields. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And I appreciate uh, your strong uh, record of leadership in this subcommittee over the last uh, of, several years. And in the past, Thank you've you. worked diligently to satisfy the concerns of all the members of this subcommittee. And for that, I'm uh, greatly appreciative. And that's why I regret that I disagree with you on this particular issue. I think the issue of whether or not to further regulate the cable industry 
was debated vigorously during the last Congress. Throughout the 101st Congress, the cable industry was widely vilified. You know, its sins, real and alleged, were publicly dissected in microscopic detail. Uh, and at that time, Congress' solution to the problem was to put the regulatory shackles on the cable industry and to make it even tougher. And I think that approach was a dismal failure. Uh, the administration threatened to veto any proposal to re-regulate the cable industry, and the Senate never could reach a consensus on its own cable bill. And I hope we don't make the same mistakes again this year. And I think it's time to step back from the rhetoric and acknowledge that other options are far more appropriate at this time. I think the pitfalls of excessive regulation are self-evident. Regulation is expensive, it's cumbersome, and it's slow to respond to the needs of consumer. Uh, rather, it's competitive solutions which bring the maximum benefit to the greatest number of consumers in the shortest period of time. And certainly, there are no easy solutions uh, to the problems in the cable industry and how they affect consumers. But in this instance, government protection is not the way to address consumer complaints. And as always, I stand ready to work with you, Mr. Chairman, and try to find uh, those competitive solutions. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just look forward to hearing the testimony from the witnesses. And uh, I was not on the committee last year, did not get to hear the debate in the committee. Uh, I know that the bill passed with overwhelming support on the, on the floor last time. It would be interesting to see what's uh, happened in the meantime. And, and so I'll just uh, reserve the balance of my time for later. The time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Bliley. Mr. Chairman, I know you're waiting to hear me on uh, my great statement, but uh, if you will grant me unanimous consent, I will uh, submit it for the record. As a former mayor, I'm most anxious to uh, hear from the mayors and uh, the councilmen. And uh, with that, I yield back the balance of my time. You were mayor of Richmond? Uh-huh. Great. Uh, I, th I don't think there's any objection to you not making an opening statement. So uh, with that, we'll move on to uh, the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Richardson. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, first, uh, I think the issue of whether uh, we are going to have a cable bill or not, or whether we're going to wait for the ACC FCC, has been, uh, has been settled, Mr. Chairman. And that is uh, the fact that you have announced here. I see the last page of your statement. Uh, it is my intention to produce a cable bill from this subcommittee expeditiously. I think that issue has been resolved. And on that score, I commend you because I've long felt that this uh, committee has taken a back seat to some of the regulatory agencies that we oversee or regulate. Uh, we are elected to make policy, and that's what we should do. Secondly, I believe that the bill that we passed last year uh, was a benchmark. It was a good bill. The cable industry participated in it. Uh, there was vigorous debate. There were many issues dealt with that are important. We dealt with the cable rates. We dealt with customer service. We dealt with uh, minority must carry, which was important to me. Uh, we dealt uh, with home shopping. I see that home shopping didn't make it in this uh, early draft. Uh, I think that's another issue we have to examine. But again, Mr. Chairman, uh, you've made the decision now, and I suspect that we'll have to settle the telco issue in some way, whether it's part of this bill or not. Uh, the only point I wish to make on the substantive basis is that I think that we have to look at, when we talk about cable rate increases, we have to look at what the actual price increase is, rather than necessarily always focusing on the percentage increase. We've had uh, deregulation since 1987, January 1st, and I think we should uh, look at this uh, on, on a price increase level rather than any other measure. Mr. Chairman, uh, I commend you. I look forward to the debate and the markup. And okay. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. <clears throat> I'll just note that uh, Mr. Bauscher from um, the state of Virginia uh, regrets his inability to be here this morning and has requested that without objection that his written statement be included in the record. And the chair would just note that uh, there is no member of our subcommittee that has a more intense interest in this issue 
and the uh, related issue of uh, uh, cable uh, telco uh, than the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Bauscher. So with that, uh, all time for opening statements from our subcommittee uh, members has expired. And now we'll turn to our, our first panel. Uh, it consists of the Honorable Sharp James, Mayor of the City of Newark, New Jersey, uh, the Honorable Kirk Schmoke, Mayor of the City of Baltimore, Maryland, uh, Councilman Ladd Siftar, Jr., Chairman of the Federal County Relations um, uh, Subcommittee for the National Association of Counties, um, uh, the Honorable Henry uh, Feldhaus, who is the Mayor of the City of uh, Shelbyville, uh, Tennessee, and um, the Mayor of uh, Miami is expected uh, imminently and will introduce him at that time. Let me begin by uh, at this point recognizing um, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Rinaldo, right now for the purpose of making our initial introduction. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, as you know, our first witness will be uh, Mayor Sharp James from the city of Newark and my home state of New Jersey. He uh, serves on the advisory board of the United States Conference of Mayors. He's chairman of the Newark Collaboration Group. He also serves on the board of directors of the National League of Cities and is testifying this morning on behalf of the National League of Cities. Um, Mayor James, I certainly want to uh, welcome you. Uh, we thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to appear before this subcommittee. And I want to mention uh, to everyone here that you were first elected mayor of Newark, I believe, back in 1986 and we're re-elected in 1990 without any opposition. And I would like to meet with you later to see if you can tell me how I can work out that kind of deal for myself next year. <laughs> Mayor James, welcome. Good to have you here. And uh, I assume with the consent of the chair, you may begin now. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Ronaldo, members of the subcommittee. On behalf of the National League of Cities and the United States Conference of Mayors, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today on problems plaguing cable consumers and on pending House bills which might address such problems. As you may know, the conference represents the more than 800 cities with populations exceeding 30,000 residents, and the League represents more than 16,000 cities and towns across the nation. Mr. Chairman, we appreciate the role the subcommittee has taken in responding to the concerns of cable consumers across the nation. We look forward to working with you in crafting legislation that will promote competition in the cable television industry and that will alleviate some of the current concerns of cable television subscribers. More than 700 mayors, city council members, county leaders, and other local elected officials identified in a letter to all members of Congress two weeks ago some of the critical provisions we believe Congress should include in cable television legislation. I have attached to my testimony a copy of the letter. I respectfully request that the subcommittee accept the letter along with this testimony as part of the formal record in this hearing. Without objection. The letter which is signed by elected officials from coast to coast and from major cities to small villages demonstrate that cable television concerns are national concerns that affect consumers from all walks of life. The letter demonstrates that elected officials are strongly united in urging Congress to enact cable legislation that truly will promote competition <laughs> and ensure that consumers receive quality, affordable cable television service. Moreover, the letter represents a resounding rebuttal to those critics of cable legislation, including James Mooney of the National Cable Television Association, who claim that local government do not care about cable television issues. <coughs> local government do care about cable television issues. Elected officials have on numerous occasions prior to signing the letter expressed their concerns to Congress about problems plaguing cable consumers. The driving force for cable legislation has been the dramatic rate increases monopolistic cable operators have imposed on cable subscribers. In the city of Newark, my constituents have suffered a 47 percent basic rate increase between 1986 and 1990, from 1225 in 1986 to 1795 in 1990, and as of December the 1st, another increase to 2095, or a 71% increase. Such issues are compounded by the unfettered ability cable operators obtain, once rates were deregulated, to impose additional charges on cable subscribers. In March 1987, less than three months after rates were deregulated, Gateway Cable, which serves the city of Newark, 
began to replace all cable television converters with more expensive converters. Gateway increased the deposit for such converters from $25 to $50. Moreover, in May 1987, Gateway began imposing an $8 additional set charge for both basic and premium channel connections. Furthermore, the cable operators charges a $5 downgrade and upgrade fee and charges $3 a month just to have this remote. The rate for basic cable service, along with the other cable-related rates and charges imposed by Gateway, are making cable television unaffordable for many residents in Newark. Think of senior citizens on fixed income, choosing between heating and eating, and now whether they should have cable TV. In the absence of competition, the only constraint on prices on the current law is a decrease in consumer demand. However, since many cable subscribers see cable as an essential service, cable operators will continue to be able to impose substantial rate increases before the loss of revenue from cable subscribers choosing to disconnect their cable service exceeds the increase and unjustifiable profits from such rate adjustment. Cable consumers also need protection against inadequate cable service. The Board of Public Utilities for the State of New Jersey, which monitors complaints against operators, reports that it received 16,000 plus complaints in 1990. The primary area of complaints were billing practices, poor quality of service, rate and fees, and inability to reach the cable company. A busy signal is all you receive when seeking service. A particular concern in Newark is the quality of the cable signal. The local cable operator for the city reports that 45 percent of the complaints it received last year concerned poor reception. Another 32 percent of it calls concern the absence of a signal. Franchising authorities have limited ability on the current law to protect consumers from the problem I've just described. Congress should enact measures to resolve such problems. Local governments believe that the best solution to such problems are provisions including a com competitive renewal provision that would stimulate competition. Until competition materializes, regulation will be needed. These are just some of the areas ripe for legislative action. I have addressed other areas in my written testimony. If it looks like a duck, acts like a duck, walk like a duck, it's a duck. Similarly, the cable television industry acts like a monopoly, looks like a monopoly, it is a monopoly. In summary, we do not want control or ownership of the cable industry. We do want improved services. We do want affordable rates. We do want improved technical standards, concerns about limitations of liability, and more importantly, meaningful renewal processes. What we really want is to make cable TV in America better. What we really want is the American dream of fair competition in the cable industry. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I thank you for the opportunity to testify the League Conference and I would welcome the opportunity to assist the subcommittee in creating legislation that will resolve current competitive and consumer protection concerns. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, very much. Uh, let me now recognize the gentleman from uh, Maryland, Mr. McMillan, once again. It's a, uh, a privilege for me to introduce our, our mayor of Baltimore, my home state. Um, he addresses some of the concerns in the 1984 deregulation bill. Baltimore has had considerable problems with its cable system. Let me also add that uh, our mayor has been a great advocate of uh, literacy campaigns, proclaiming Baltimore as a city that reads. And given cable's interest in educational program, I think it's particularly appropriate that he's here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with the consent of the chair, I guess he can begin. Good morning. I'd like to thank the chairman and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the United States Conference of Mayors and the uh, National League of Cities. I'll be talking about the problems in the cable industry and offering some solutions. My testimony, which I respectfully request be made a part of the formal record of this hearing, focuses on Baltimore but applies to cable consumers across the nation. With cable television now firmly rooted in most big cities, local government can no longer ignore the regulatory and competitive problems of this industry. Uh, my Office of Cable and Communications and similar agencies in other cities receive a substantial number of consumer complaints about the quality and affordability of the cable service. One of the most important issues confronting uh, subscribers since the passage of the 1984 Cable Act has been rate increases. 
In Baltimore, we've seen the price of basic cable service increase 50 percent since June of 1986. These increases are not unique in, in Baltimore. Between December 1988 and February 1991, cities and counties throughout this region face similar increases. Fairfax County, up 50 percent. Montgomery County, 41 percent. District of Columbia, 40 percent. Alexandria, 37 percent. And Arlington, 33 percent. While the rate of inflation during this two-year period for that region was only about 12 percent. But it's not just the increasing rates for basic service that concern subscribers. That problem is compounded by the fact that cable operators are able to impose significant charges for equipment used to receive cable services. These charges are in addition to installation fees, which are frequently themselves unreasonable. The equipment charges sometimes leave citizens in the position of having to pay money simply to use features that already exist on their TVs and VCRs. For example, many cable subscribers now have cable-ready televisions that are capable of receiving more than 100 cable stations. However, since United Artists Cable, which has the franchise in Baltimore, scrambles its cable signal, many subscribers are unable to enjoy the cable-ready functions of their television sets, such as the ability to record their VCRs while watching another channel. In Baltimore, to record a program while watching another program, which is a major benefit of the cable-ready television, the subscriber must pay United for a second converter. That's one common complaint of consumers. Another is that in addition to the basic cable service charge, subscribers wishing to use their remote control must pay United $2 per month. If the fee isn't paid, the, the subscriber's remote, which comes with his or her TV and has already been paid for, is rendered useless. These kinds of fee problems have led to many complaints that my city and others do not have the authority to address under the existing cable act. As such, our staff ends up telling citizens that the city cannot help them. As for complaints relating to service installa and installation and billing and so on, we receive about, in the city, about 100 to 125 such complaints per month. Should note, uh, Mr. Chairman, that that is down, uh, the monthly complaints are down from an average of 175 complaints per month in the previous years, and I'll explain why we think that has occurred. Our ability to resolve these service problems is only marginally better than our ability to correct excessive fees and overcharges. Thus, the changes in service have come primarily as a response to consistent pressure from the city and the public and a change in management at United Cable in Baltimore. The new president of United Cable knows that it is in the best interest of his company to quickly and promptly address consumer complaints. I'm pleased about this. But I know that another change in United's leadership, this time perhaps a less responsive person, is possible. And my point is that cable subscribers should not be left subject to the whims of any particular cable management team. Instead, we have to recognize that the cable industry is much more akin to a public utility than a private business and needs sufficient government oversight and regulation to protect the interests of consumers. Like utilities, cable is, in effect, the monopoly market. But unlike utilities, it is subject to little, if any, public control. This leaves consumers highly vulnerable dependent only upon the varying degree of public responsibility of a particular cable operator, and ironically, the consumer's ability to operate their own televisions and remote controls and VCRs and other equipment is subject to control and changes from an industry which itself is free from any meaningful public accountability. Congress must take action to address these concerns. The best long-term solution would be provisions that stimulate competition among cable operators. But in the interim, it is necessary for Congress to take action to protect consumers from the abuses of cable operators. It is now overwhelmingly clear that the Cable Act of 1984, which was intended to stimulate competition and benefit consumers, has not succeeded in that goal. Congress must enact corrective legislation 
if our fellow citizens are to enjoy relief from problems that now seem endemic to the cable industry. As for my specific recommendations regarding regulation of fees and provisions of H.R. 1303, I refer to uh, my uh, written testimony, which is submitted uh, for the uh, record of these hearings. So let me thank you again for the opportunity to testify concerning these issues of importance to cable consumers across the country. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Once again, um, let us uh, let me now turn and uh, recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. Thank the chair for yielding. I would like to once again, Mayor of Felton House, Tennessee. Shelbyville, Tennessee in particular, a mayor who's not only worked extremely hard for his constituents at the local level, but also now on the national level, because these are very real issues. These mayors, of course, are each chosen because they come from different uh, members of districts or members areas. But we could have picked virtually any mayor in America and gotten the same set of complaints. That's so, what's so aggravating about this problem. And it's not just a new set of complaints. We've been hearing this for years year in, year out, and yet nothing has been done. So I hope with the good help of you gentlemen, and I hope that Chairman Sykes, the FCC Commissioner, although he doesn't seem to be here now, is listening to this testimony, I hope that we'll be able to achieve real action this year. Mayor Feldhaus. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you on the problems facing America's smaller cities and towns concerning cable television. I would also like to thank you for the work you and the committee are undertaking to address the many problems we local officials are dealing with in terms of poor cable service and rate increases. I am the mayor of Shelbyville, Tennessee, population 14,029, located about one hour southeast of Nashville. Although we are located near this larger city, we are in what you might call a fringe area. That is, we are not able to receive many of the channels that our larger neighbor does. Without cable, our citizens are able to watch a grand total of four network stations and a UHF, UHF station if you're in the right spot and the wind is just right. Shelbyville is one of those cities with over three network channels, deemed to have effective competition by FCC standards which means our cable company cannot be regulated by the government. In Shelbyville, we have had many of the same experiences my colleagues here have just described. Increased cable rates, changes in basic programming, along with constant frustration ex expressed by our citizens over the lack of response from our local cable company to their concerns. Shelbyville has also experienced a high turnover rate in cable company operators as small companies have been bought out and gobbled up by larger conglomerates. I myself have seen our local cable company change at least five times. And at times, it changed owners faster than we could change the names on the franchise paperwork at City Hall. We are currently being served by United Artists, and the turnover situation in our town has somewhat stabilized. However, our rates and services have not. I recently received this letter informing me that because our senior and, and I quote, senior and fixed income citizens have had difficulty paying higher cable rates in the past, United Artists would now be offering budget cable at a $4 discount from our previous cable rate of $16.95. A closer examination of this $4 discount reveals that United Artists also happened to drop 13 stations from our basic cable tier of 23 stations. This new budget cable offers our citizens only 10 stations, five of which are the regular over-the-air TV networks, two are local shopping and advertising stations, and one is C-SPAN. Many of the channels we used to receive the ones which we originally purchased cable for, are now at the next higher price level called Plus Service. Plus Service is available to us with three more selections in programming at the new higher $6 rate, and they include Black Entertainment Television, Country Music Television, and Sports South, all for an extra $6. 
It doesn't take a genius to figure out that our rates will be going up $2 for basically the same programming. There was an immediate reaction by my constituents to this cable increase. I have received numerous complaints about the actions of the cable company as if we at the local level could do something about it. I must reiterate my colleagues' complaint that our hands are tied at the local level. Our small city is in no position to do battle with the cable television industry, and we as local officials are unable to defend our citizens against rate increases. Local officials are on the front lines when it comes to dealing with the cable consumer, and we are here today requesting some relief. Legislation is needed that will give local officials more control over the cable systems located in their cities and affecting their citizens. Although legislation to encourage competition may be the answer in more urban areas, it is hard to believe it would produce a competitor in Shelbyville. Since deregulation of the cable industry, not one single interested cable provider has contacted us about a franchise other than the one we already have. In our efforts to gain cable regulation from Congress, we have been told that consumers are happy with cable. My presence and that of my colleagues attest to the fact that consumers do complain, and we at City Hall hear the complaints all the time. And now we are urging you as federal policymakers to give us the tools to respond to those complaints, preferably at the local level. Thank you again for the opportunity to share my views with the committee. All right, thank you, Mr. Felthaus. Our next uh, witness, uh, Councilman uh, Siftar, whenever you feel comfortable, please begin your testimony. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, uh, my name is Lad Siftar. I'm a member of County Council from Northampton County, Pennsylvania, and I chair the National Association of Counties Federal County Subcommittee on Intergovernmental Relations. On behalf of the National Association of Counties, I want to thank you for inviting me to testify this morning before the Telecommunications and Finance Subcommittee on the subject of uh, cable television legislation. The county in which I live is unique in terms of cable television. It was the first area in the United States to be served by cable TV. As a matter of fact, we had cable TV uh, first back in the er uh, late 1940s. So we've had uh, over 40 years of service uh, in cable television. Service Electric Cable TV Company is the oldest cable operator in the country. Northampton County is one of the very few areas where true head-to-head -head competition exists. There are four cable franchises in our county, and all households or most households, have a choice of at least two, and sometimes three. In fact, two se separate cables run through my own backyard. Two of the four cable companies are locally owned, and that makes them very responsive to the community. We have great coverage of local sports, politics, and news in general. Our cable TV is fairly priced, of good quality, and we receive excellent service from our four cable operators. Our goal at NACO is to get Congress to pass legislation which would make all cable systems as good as the ones we have in Northampton County. That is the reason we joined with the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the League of Cities in a recent letter to Congress asking for changes to the Cable Act. About 100 of the over 700 signatures on that letter are from elected county officials. That is why our association developed new policy on cable last year. The essence of our policy is a call for Congress to pass legislation which would allow counties to play a larger role in regulating cable and which would encourage competition. County officials do not want to regulate simply because they enjoy exercising power. The reason NACO members want regulatory authority is because they view some cable operators as being beyond the control of anyone. There is simply no way presently for local governments to keep rates in check or ensure good customer service. Legislation must be enacted which allows county governments, if they so choose, to regulate rates. Those regulated rates should include those popular channels which are the reason most people subscribe to cable. 
H.R. 1303 does not allow local government that authority. Allowing local governments to only regulate over-the-air broadcast signals will not solve the problem. If Congress allows broad-based rate-setting authority lo to local governments within that new environment, we would support some ability for the cable operator to appeal a local government decision to the Federal Communications Commission. However, we do not want to see an appeal process established which is so costly and so lengthy that no local government would chance rate regulation. In addition to rates, local governments need to continue to have the right to set con consumer service standards. Under no circumstances should the federal government preempt these standards. Minimum federal standards are another item entirely. And as long as they were viewed as a floor, we would support them. H.R. 1303 is an improvement over last year's House bill, but we believe the customer service section should be stronger. Like any other service contracted for, county government should ultimately have the clear right to tell a cable operator the service they have been providing is substandard and that they are going to look at other alternatives. That does not appear to be the case under current law. The legal standards for denial of renewal are so stringent that local governments simply do not deny renewals or even open up renewals to competitive bids. Think of how bizarre it must sound to a taxpayer who feels he has been gouged by cable rates and who has received substandard service when a local official tells him or her that even though the 10-year franchise period is about to expire, the county cannot deny the renewal or even open it up to see if there is a better offer out there. We might as well be granting franchises in perpetuity. We hope that you, Chairman Markey, will change your bill to address this issue. The other form of competition is to allow and encourage other technologies that offer video services. My experience in Northampton County is that if, if there is real competition, rates and customer service will be what they should be. Therefore, Congress should pass legislation which encourages competition to cable. This includes the phone companies. NACO supports telco entry. However, all competition must be done with, sa with safeguards, including a prohibition against cross-subsidy and a requirement that phone companies go through a franchising process in a similar manner to a cable company, and that it pay a franchise fee to the local government. Without these requirements and protections, NACO would not support telco entry. Let me add that the other reason I support competition is that I believe it will encourage the development of new technologies and will enable the United States to remain in the forefront of, worldwide of the worldwide communications revolution which we are currently experiencing. Um, as a footnote, it's, it's just been my experience that, uh, and I think the opinion of many other people, that America has lost leadership in several other industries. I know in my own community, um, we've had presence of Bethlehem Steel, Western Electric. We've lost uh, some of the leadership in the steel industry, uh, the electronics industry, uh, the automotive industry. I don't think America can afford to come out second uh, in the telecommunications industry. New technologies will also allow more cable service in rural areas. Cable is available in most urban and suburban areas, but NACO members tell us <clears throat> that a significant amount of rural America is still without service. The cable companies find it too costly to put in service. Competition will promote deployment of new technologies which would help our rural communities. That completes my testimony. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the other members of the subcommittee for uh, your uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sifta, very much. Uh, let me now uh, recognize the gentleman from the state of Florida, Mr. Belarakis, for the purpose of introducing our next witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, you do me honor in asking me to uh, 
uh, to do this. I, uh, being the only Florida member of the Committee of Energy and Commerce, uh, uh, I do have the enviable task of uh, introducing a gentleman who is not uh, my constituent, uh, uh, but my son uh, was a medical student at the University of Miami for four years and had been his constituent for a number of years. Uh, a gentleman who is uh, very highly thought of in the area, uh, a member of the opposite party, I might add, so I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not pouring it on uh, for political reasons, uh, but who... Uh, Whose well, family uh, was among... 91 percent favorability as a party. You can afford to be generous. We, we can afford uh, to be generous. Yeah. But his, he and his family uh, uh, are among that, that strong, courageous group of people, Mr. Chairman, who uh, were basically pushed out of their, their homeland, Cuba, and who have made uh, 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 great citizens uh, of, of this country of ours. And we're so very, very proud to have the Cuban Americans in this country. And I'm particularly proud to introduce to our committee uh, uh, the mayor of Miami, Honorable uh, Suarez. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Congressman, Mr. Chairman. Members, let me say first of all that, uh, not to contradict the fine congressman from our state, but I have still maintained my political independence and I am still independent. Um, although some people maybe identify me as being a member of one of the two parties. I am awed by being here with you. Um, I am a part-time mayor and that's why part of the reason I'm a little late. Uh, my citizens have seen fit to leave my salary at $5,000 a year. Uh, works out to $2.40 an hour, assuming a 40-hour week. And I guarantee you that we put in a lot more than 40 hours. I'm awed by being in the company of uh, Sharp James and a Kurt Schmoke, Mayor Feldhaus. And I'm awed, awed also by being here with uh, Congressman Oxley, with whom I just shared a trip to Kuwait. And uh, let me say that he is so assertive and aggressive that we thought he might go all the way to Baghdad himself and and depose uh, Mr. Hussein single-handedly. We, uh, my, my expertise is going to be just a little bit more on the side of the minimum customer service that should be uh, regulated into existence than the rate making. But I would like to say something about the competitive aspects of what we're trying to accomplish in both the national, state, and local level. And, and I have to preface that by saying this is probably the most complex topic that I have tried to handle uh, in congressional testimony. And uh, I've had uh, all of 24 hours to try to acquaint myself with it. But we do have some interesting anecdotal experiences in our own community. Uh, my my uh, written testimony has been submitted to you and probably is a little bit more coherent than what I can tell you at this particular point. Uh, let me say, though, even in the area of rate making, that uh, there's no doubt on the general principles that we would like to see you apply in the regulatory area as you do both, uh, as you do rate making and the fostering of competition, which is I think everyone's uh, basic purpose. Uh, and, and that's number one point. In fact, we want to foster competition. We all know we want to do that. Uh, number two, the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the National League of Cities that I am pleased to uh, speak on behalf of agree that uh, there should be a strong regulatory presence by you, as indeed by ourselves, uh, in, the, in order to force that competition. Um, we don't think it would happen naturally. We are very, very doubtful of the fact that just by very, very generic legislation, we would have the competition that we have not seen to date. In my own city, we have an exclusive franchise, and it's been quite difficult to deal with them. Let me add that we have just uh, gone through litigation with them. Anything you can do to create a situation of immunity from liability to the extent that constitutionally and contractually that can be done, we would greatly appreciate because we stand right now uh, to lose $125,000 just from the legal fees of litigation that we've had with our cable franchisee. And we really would like to see ways to, to get, uh, get out of that. The citizens don't deserve that even if we occasionally do not prevail in court on some battle with our franchisee. Uh, everyone also agrees, or we agree certainly, that, uh, as was stated uh, by the prior speaker, that we should encourage competition from telephone, telecommunications, telematics, uh, wireless cable, any other system, plus some that I think we're not aware of at this point, but we're going to be seeing some entirely new systems coming up in the future. And uh, we should be ready to encourage competition from those. The more, the better. 
and uh, the uh, consumer will be better served that way. Our cities, at least the larger cities, I can't speak for the smaller cities, but the larger cities, Mr. Chairman, are ready to participate vigorously in the uh, rate regulatory aspects of this. We have the expertise, we have the staff, uh, and, and we're willing to do and, and interested in doing the bulk of the regulatory aspect of rate making. Uh, we understand that at the national, federal level, they'll be supervising, there'll be uh, minimum standard setting, and possibly some appellate function to be carried out if someone is not satisfied with the local determination. But we would like to do the bulk of that. We think we're most competent to do it. And we think that it's been a traditional function uh, that we also have a certain amount of jurisdiction over by virtue of holding the easements that most of these people are going to be using uh, in the case of, of cable. Um, finally, and the, fi the final point is please understand, I think I speak for all the mayors of large cities and small cities, we don't want to profit from the regular the regulation that may be imposed and we think is necessary. Uh, we want all savings to be passed on to the consumers. We don't want to, you know, this is not a way of us balancing our budgets. We, uh, many of us have inherited some very, very difficult uh, budgetary situations. Uh, we're new era mayors, at least we'd like to think we are, and uh, we've been saddled with some mistakes of the past, but we don't expect to correct those and to solve our economic situation and economic problems by taxing cable consumers. That's not our, our purpose. Our purpose is to give them better service at, uh, at less cost. Uh, let me get into the service standards, which, which is where I think we've had uh, most experience, and do it by giving you two quick anecdotes of things that happened to us. We were, um, in one case I related to our, to our franchisee, we were watching, I believe it was a Super Bowl, at the home of one of my fellow commissioners. We only have five of us on the commission. We each uh, have equal votes. And uh, we're watching the Super Bowl at a commissioner's home, and you know the, the cable connection has typically a black box. We have that in our, in our system. And uh, we couldn't get a signal from uh, the broadcast station that had the Super Bowl. And uh, we figured out pretty soon that uh, the box was the problem. Well, thank God in the room there was someone who knew, A, that you could bypass the box, and B, knew how to do it. Uh, because he was able to bypass the box, and all of a sudden we got a direct signal. I said to our cable company, I said, why have you not told the consumers that that can be done in a pinch when the signal's not coming in for whatever reason? Why have you not told them that? And why have you not provided further a simple mechanism, a button that you should push so that you can bypass the, uh, the black box and get your direct signal and at least get the basic service, which you would otherwise get, but that you're not set up to get because your antennas aren't uh, functioning particularly well since you have cable connections. And they didn't really have any good answers. So I submit to you that that is the typical kind of uh, improvement that we can make if we're allowed to set uh, minimum standards. Uh, the, the second story has to do with the testimony that they were giving to us. And it struck me that they are extremely good, Mr. Chairman at, uh, and members, they're extremely good at knowing who is not paying. They're extremely good at monitoring uh, all of the folks that are on the system. They presumably are very good at uh, f finding out if someone additional has hooked into the system that is not supposed to be getting the signal. And yet I said, you have a closed loop and you have your circuits and everything else. Should you not also be able technically to determine if someone is not getting a signal and someone is, uh, is missing out on the service? And even better, should you not be able to determine that that individual, that home, is uh, in fact uh, has lost the signal for X number of minutes or hours or days and therefore adjust your charges for that month accordingly. And they said, well, we could technically do that. It took a little while to get that out of them, uh, but we don't have that capability right now, but it can be done technically. I submit to you again that uh, in our aggressive posture and I think technically competent posture and, and, and experience with dealing with cable companies, we would be able to implement those kinds of uh, consumer safeguards. We also had, I'll tell you one last anecdote and I'll, I'll leave it at that. I know I'm exceeding my time. Uh, one last anecdote is that we complained to them in the middle of a commission hearing, that uh, City of Miami Commission hearing, that uh, getting service wasn't all that easy and getting through to the company by phone was not easy. And they said the phone won't ring three times before they pick it up and, and uh, with customer uh, complaints. So we called right from the commission. I had one of the aides there call, and, and it was a long time before the company managed to get on the phone and give us any sort of help 
uh, on the inquiry that we had, which obviously was artificial there, but has is, is been uh, known to be uh, to, you know, to affect quite a few people. I forget exactly how many complaints we have. It's all in my testimony. They have been improving, and we've been tightening. And uh, we think that, uh, in conclusion, uh, we particularly want to have the ability, as was stated before, uh, to adjust, to rebid, to uh, add competition at the renewal time. The idea that we're saddled with someone for, for the duration is, is unacceptable. We're convinced that they have their initial investment recouped by the time the, uh, the initial term is over. Uh, we would like in renewals, in new franchise uh, awards, in legally permissible modifications to the existing franchise, please give us the widest possible regulatory reign, and we'll, you will use it wisely and to the benefit of the consumers. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, very much. Now we'll turn to uh, questions from the uh, uh, subcommittee. And uh, the Chair will recognize himself to uh, ask a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, um, uh, what is the attitude which uh, you bring to the uh, subject of the FCC um, proceeding to uh, redefine competition um, in a way that, uh, uh, from their perspective, will obviate the need uh, for um, legislation in, uh, in many uh, ways uh, and, uh, and satisfy uh, the desire for uh, there to be some sense of uh, a governmental position with regard to what does constitute competition. And that is to basically just redefine what television stations, uh, what number of television stations would have to be in a service area in order to uh, provide sufficient competition. Do any of you want to comment on that uh, subject? We're encouraged by what FCCC is saying, uh, Mr. Chairman, but I believe that uh, we found that it does not go far enough. And I know you talked about the six signals in an area. What we found is they're focusing on the lower tiers. And, and, and quite frankly, uh, as you have a captive audience and people begin to identify their preference <coughs> of the programs which America really wants to watch is moved to a second, third, and fourth tier where we do not find regulation. So we're finding regulation uh, at the bottom, uh, whereby many of those programs you can get by put a coat hanger in your TV set anyway and bring them in. And so therefore, it is a, a step in the right direction, but it does not go far enough. Also, when we talk about the FCC, uh, there is no concerns expressed by them dealing with the damage immunity provisions, which only Congress can, can uh, regulate. Uh, no concerns about the re fair renewal processes, which only Congress can address. No customer service standards, which again, Congress would have to address. And also, this question earlier I made mention of re-tiering, whereby if you identify what you like, the next year will not be there. If you recall the case in Hoboken, when they first had their cable uh, television franchise, the Yankees came in and Mel Allen and all the people. And as soon as you said, we like that, uh, it was moved to other tiers, et cetera, et cetera. So we're encouraged by their concerns, but it doesn't go far enough. On their concerns about having that rate regulation regime, again, we believe that it's the local mayors and local council person who are getting the bulk of the complaints. We should be the regulatory agency, and then we should appeal to FCC as opposed to feeling that the <coughs> federal office can be really monitor what local complaints are. Our office are the ones inundated with the problems. Well, let me let me uh, let me ask this then. There are many who uh, complained uh, during the period of time when uh, states and local municipalities had uh, more control over cable systems that there were great abuses, uh, that there were uh, practices which were reprehensible, and as a result, uh, uh, legislation uh, was passed. Uh, that largely removed um, a control away from the local level, but uh, with uh, a return to the, um, to the local communities that gave them a certain percentage of the gross receipts from uh, any of these local cable franchises. Um, if we were to pass legislation to um, restore 
powers to the state and uh, local governments. Um, what kind of um, assurances could the Congress receive uh, that we wouldn't see a recurrence of those kinds of abuses that we saw during uh, previous years? Mayor Suarez. Mr. Chairman, I want to say the system as it now exists is not working to foster competition. None of us, I think, up here have any problem with the idea of uh, multi-franchising. Uh, we, we actually try to do it in my, in my uh, community. It hasn't worked so far. Maybe around the time of renewal, we'll figure out a way to do it. But we need the congressional legislation, I understand, that will uh, give us more capacity <coughs> to do that. In a cooperative way, and without losing your ultimate discretion, either by some appellate process or by joint uh, regulatory um, faculties with us, I think that you can make sure that those abuses don't, don't, don't happen. Uh, all of us who are up here are inheriting, in some ways, the, the, the history of what's happened in the past. In my particular case, we have a franchise in place. I wish that I had a chance to, to have approved that because I think we would have tried for multiple franchising. I think we would have avoided a lot of the abuses and I think we would have figured out how to get lower rates by effective competition. The, the way to do it now is we do have the information, as, as Mayor James said, we do get the complaints. Uh, uh, we are there. We're, we're local. Each city has a different situation from every other city. I really there uh, say and suggest to you that uh, if you don't have an incredible amount of flexibility, small cities and large cities will be in a totally different situation by the number of uh, channels that are available, by, the, by the, uh, the ability to fight with the big boys. Uh, the big cities probably can do that if we have, if we have your authorization to, to regulate in the area. And so I think a cooperative effort would work the best to avoid the abuses. And frankly, one last statement on prior abuses. None of us who are up here are responsible for any of those. They're, there have been abuses uh, in the U.S. Congress, too, from prior congressmen who didn't do as good a job of regulating as the ones that are here now. And uh, we've improved over the years. The voters have thrown out some of the, some of the bums, if I may say so. And uh, we, we, the, the point is that theoretically and, and in fact, we are better poised, I think, to do the regulating. But uh, we'd be happy to have you looking over the shoulders to, to make sure that we don't, uh, that we don't overdo it or, or we're not unfair to any one applicant or whatever. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, very much. My time has expired. Once again, recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, continue with uh, Mayor Suarez for a few moments. Mayor, as you know, the, uh, probably know, the FCC recommended in its 1990 cable report that cities should not unreasonably refuse to deny a second cable franchise. The administration endorsed that position, and the FCC stated, in effect, that cities could grant a second franchise. Why don't they grant a second franchise if there's nothing in the Cable Act that prohibits cities from granting another franchise at any time? Why can't another franchise be granted? Well, in our case, uh, Congressman, we tried. And uh, my testimony, written testimony to you today, says that we didn't get any additional bidders. My, my guess is that we have yet to create the proper uh, conditions for that additional franchise. I'd love to have two, three, four, whatever number. Uh, I think if we follow a pattern that I understand was used in the uh, telephone uh, industry, and, and I think in this particular city I know was, was, was effective, uh, of requiring that the, uh, the lines be rented, the trunk lines, the basic system be rented to competitors at, at reasonable rates, and if those rates are set uh, fairly, I think that you'll see competition. And um, the, the technology is there for competition. Uh, if we have the authority, I guarantee you, all the mayors up here, once again, don't want a profit. We don't want more power. We don't want more dominion. We want to give the best service. And I think all of us would encourage additional franchising. I certainly, for my city, can say that we, we have even tried it. And my point is, you do have the authority. Yet you said you didn't get any bids. What conditions would you suggest we create to help you get more bids? With an existing franchise in place and with the discouragement in the law to, uh, in, at the renewal moment, which we're approaching in our case, uh, to a whole new franchise, uh, we're in a competitive disadvantage with our existing franchisee. We need the authority to, to go beyond that to uh, full regulatory uh, abilities and capacities before we can, we can set the conditions so that another bidder can come in. Congressman, and that, that's my understanding. Now, the, the economics of it are complicated, but uh, I think we can create it. If you give us the authority, we can create the, the economic uh, incentives for, for the additional bidders. If, if a city's big enough and if, uh, and if you make available uh, some of the existing network that is in place. Certainly, of course, we know that other 
technologies won in. Would the steps proposed by the FCC and the administration, in your opinion, help foster cable competition? Now you've exceeded my, my legal understanding of the situation, maybe. No, I thought you were going to respond on that. Mayor James, do you want to respond? No, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part of the question, Congressman. I, I asked whether or not the steps the, in other words, what, what I'm saying is, uh, I'm going back to my initial statement, that the FCC right. recommended that cities should not unreasonably refuse to deny a second cable franchise. We accept that. We accept the fact that others can come in, but I think it's being Have stated. Have you been able to get anyone else to come in? Uh, Have you tried? We're, we're saying, Congressman, that there seems to be a country club agreement by other cable operators that, number one, they do not go into a municipality where another one exists. And then also our concerns about statutory uh, limitations of liability. Uh, they simply, when you try to go in there, you're stepping on their wires. You have the city in Michigan uh, where the, the city itself tried to enter into the business, and they're being sued about you touched our wires, you're near our wires, you're damaging the quality of our signal. And there again, you have the power of a monopoly using all of its financial resources to tie that municipality up in courts. So until there's some controls about uh, how long can you stay in courts and what they can recoup, the threat of their taking you into court for an extended period of time and the exposure of that municipality or other cable operator makes it unattractive. The wireless companies come in, they cannot buy the other packages which are not available to them unless it's prohibited cost or it's not available to them. So again, there is a climate that is a closed shop. And I think that's what our testimony speaks to, regulation by Congress that would open it up, encourage competition, not mandate it. Well, let me ask all of the mayors, did any mayor tell us what they have done to encourage, if anything, competition or to get another cable company in? In uh, Baltimore, we have uh, sought to uh, bring in another uh, cable company. We have a non-exclusive franchise agreement uh, that the agreement does last, however, till 2004, um, which uh, does help the existing uh, operator a bit. Uh, but we have uh, attempted to bring in a, a second operator. What we have seen is that under the, ex the existing company uh, only has a 35 percent uh, penetration rate in the community. And so I think that that um, may, from, from a second operator's point of view, uh, ours may not appear a very attractive market because the uh, single operator at this time only has 35 percent uh, penetration. And so that, uh, I think that that is probably the most discouraging factor uh, to uh, attracting a, a second operator. Well, maybe that the still second doesn't operator, deal with the issue. Provide, maybe if the second operator provided better service and lower rates, they'd get some of that 35 percent and maybe sign up 35 percent more. Well, that, that, that may be true, but it still doesn't deal with the other issues about the equipment and fees and, and quality of service. And the, the, so there's a, a broader issue than just bringing in the competition. We would like to know what do we do with the quality of service while we're waiting for another operator to come in. Carl, let me give you one other specific example of what happened in another municipality we're giving you from our experience. Another cable company went through the expense of coming in, spent millions of dollars, and then the other company lowered their rates the day they are ready to operate. What does that mean? Then you maintain your customer or attract other companies. Now, this other company has created debt that they cannot recoup uh, the regular savings on the investment. You, do you understand what I'm saying? They, once you've spent millions of dollars to come in, the other company, the day you're ready to operate, drops their rate because they can sustain a loss for a period of time. So now you have unfair competition and all the monies that you put in trying to come into that municipality, you would stand to lose. These kinds of problems make it unattractive for others to try to go in where one company is presently operating. You spend $3 million, and the day you open up, I say my rate is now $5 for the basic package instead of $15. Now who's going to come to the new franchise? Now you've created debt. So there are all kinds of problems that need the help of Congress to regulate. Yep. I have a specific example of that in Glasgow, Kentucky, on an advertisement that their local, Glasgow started their own municipal cable system to compete with the Scripps-Howard network, 
and they lowered the Glasgow rate started out at $13.50, which was less than the $14 something rate that Scripps Howard was had. At the same time Glasgow's system went on, Scripps Howard lowered, they had two different rates, one at $5.95 a month and the other $8.95 a month. That same cable system, according to this ad, in Kentucky and Tennessee, all around Glasgow, that same service is anywhere from a low of about $17.75 to a high of $20.48. So what happens is the monopolies just use that town as a loss leader situation to try to drive the municipal system out. All right, well, uh, my time's expired. Let me just conclude on one note. There's been a lot of talk about uh, regulation of service and poor service and rates and poor service were the engines that drove cable legislation last year. Let me say that under Section 632 of the Cable Act, as I understand it, cities have the power to make and enforce customer service standards. And I would hope somewhere along the line, in fact, I would uh, encourage any of you who want to, to submit written, written testimony explaining why cities keep claiming that they don't have sufficient ability to force improvements in cable companies, uh, s cable systems, customer service. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I request that the record remain open and that the mayors respond to that question. Without objection, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Alabama. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would direct this to, to any of the mayors that wish to answer it. Um, have you seen any, th any changes uh, since this legislation was first passed uh, in the House last year uh, as far as your situations uh, in your, your particular towns and the problems you've experienced with cable? In our specific situation, we've gone through this re-tiering, which I don't know if that's a result of what Congress did last year, but it might be a result to address the question on FCC potential regulation where they've changed the basic cable, they've split that into two different tiers, one called budget cable, which would technically be regulated under maybe the new FCC regulations, but the channels that everybody really wants, like CNN News and Turner Network, the Weather Channel and Nickelodeon and those type things, in the basic cable rate would not be regulated, so that wouldn't help us, but I think maybe they're just getting smarter at how to re-tier it. Congressman, that is I'm, I'm very well explained there that the cable industry have heard the hue and cry that uh, we're just crazy and whistling in the dark and uh, the reason rates have increased is because we're pro they're providing more services and more channels and that is correct but what they're providing you is again what we stated earlier that you can receive with a coat hanger and again the things you want you have to pay for more and more and the things you really want uh, those are the items out of the FCC which are not being regulated. The basic package in the beginning was everything every American wanted. And once they identified what you really wanted, they said this is what you will pay for, so it moved out, and then we got a large number of the basic package of things that you would get anyway, uh, channels that you can't give away. And what we're trying to say that for effective competition, you need to regulate what America wants to see. CNN, which used to be basic package, is now moving out to the second tier, the third tier, and the fourth tier where you have to pay for it. So they're becoming clever and trying to disguise what they're doing. Also, in answer to Congressman Ronaldo's earlier question, it is only at renewal time that people talk about fiber optic, Everything gets great the last 30 days. When renewal time comes up, it's uh, steak and potato in every garage, and, and, and we'll treat you nice, and we love you, and we'll answer you, and we'll have door service. Once renewal goes, they go back to their regular, you know, disguise, and you clearly understand what I'm trying to say. I think, Congressman, there's, there's another danger here, and I, I believe with this tiered system, um, uh, if, it, if it becomes pervasive, uh, what we're going to see are two classes of Americans, those that are going to be information rich and those that are going to be information poor. There are going to be some people that can afford to have um, the entertainment and the information and all kinds of other services that are going to eventually be coming because of the new technologies and other people who will not be able to get the information, the entertainment or the services. 
In my own case, I have a, an 81-year-old father who had a stroke. Uh, cable is a, a very serious part of his life. Uh, he's unable to get around, but that's his major source of entertainment and news. I think it's going to do a great deal of damage to uh, the very young, uh, the, the elderly who may not be able to afford something else, and uh, the people that are just not quite as well off if uh, we allow this to, to occur. Would it be a fair statement then that uh, each of you see the FCC the new recommendations as maybe a giant step for them, but a small step for the consumer? Too far away from the real problem, the problems at the local level, and we do not feel that the FCC, with all good intentions, are not going to address those fundamental issues which we've talked about, consumer service, renewal processes, uh, the real rate regulation regime. They're just too far away as a federal agency and a bureaucracy to deal with the problem at the local level. And, if, and I think regulation is a two-way street. It means if you have bad cable operators, uh, they should be punished. And if we have bad elected officials, uh, there should be ways to address them as well. We're not here seeking to uh, be all good guys and they're the bad guys. And I think we also recognize the fact that there are many good operators out there too. But I think basically the industry is not regulated enough, and that's our concern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Ohio. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Gentleman from Colorado. Yes. I uh, thank the gentleman from Ohio for recognizing seniority uh, in this particular case. Uh, <laughs> at least, at least today. At least today. And welcome back from Kuwait. I'm glad you didn't go up to Baghdad. Uh, I just want to make a couple points. Uh, uh, in reference to Mr. Ronaldo's uh, questioning and, uh, and comments, I, I, my information shows that 53 cities now have multiple franchises. So uh, we're not in a, in a situation where it cannot be done. Also, in a couple instances, uh, it was mentioned about senior citizens and the uh, lifeline. Uh, I know that uh, my mother is one of those, and... Uh, my mother is one of those, and she gets a, uh, a discount uh, for, uh, for being a, a senior citizen. And uh, I don't know what the, uh, the situation is throughout the country, but uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have that left open for the record so that uh, we might see where, indeed, uh, these cable companies are given discounts for, uh, for seniors and, in one form or another. And I'd also like to uh, commend uh, Mayor Smoke for uh, his proclamation designated in April 1991 as Cable Month in Baltimore, uh, which uh, is a, a very uh, nice proclamation uh, in uh, regards to the cable industry. And uh, without object, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have this made as part of the record. Without objection. Uh, also, uh, in uh, my district, and I know throughout many areas of the country, uh, the cable operators have been uh, very active in wiring free uh, schools. Uh, that uh, at no cost. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a, uh, a, there is a runaway home uh, for teenagers in my district, uh, the Gemini House that United Artists, uh, I called and asked them to come in and, and wire. So I think these are some things that uh, we certainly have to uh, recognize. Now, I've never liked dealing with percentages, and this is what a lot of people have been talking about today as far as increases go. And uh, the information that I have is that uh, the uh, cities that we're talking about here today uh, receive at least 30 basic channels for less than $20 a month. Uh, I'm just uh, looking at other increases in costs, whether it's football tickets or movie tickets or anything else. Uh, is this seem to be excessive? I'd like to have someone comment on that. And I, I have the figures here. Uh, Baltimore, uh, 43 channels at $70.35 a month. Miami, 42 channels at $19.95 a month. Newark, seven, 42 channels at $17.95 a month, et cetera. Uh, are we talking about excessive uh, situation here? I'd like to just uh, respond to the general uh, direction of the questions and to clarify one point. If, uh, and I think we have mentioned that renewal is, is important to all of us. We're all, at least in Miami, we're involved in a contractual relationship by a pre-existing uh, franchise. If the regulatory 
scheme is not superimposed and the regulatory authority is not superimposed by Congress, uh, and if indeed at time of renewal our regulatory abilities are decreased, we will never be able to uh, foster the kind of competition, multi-franchising, uh, uh, additional services, and effective uh, improvement of the service that we would like to do. I mean, we any any uh, uh, inabilities that we have now, uh, are, and, and rate may not be one of them. In our particular case, we may have we may have worked out a pretty reasonably good rate in the city of Miami. Although I think you'll see in my testimony that the installation. Uh, well, the rates have gone up 99%, uh, uh, I think, in the last uh, five years, uh, which is substantially more than inflation, thank God. And uh, installation has gone up also from 25 to like $60, over, over 100% uh, in the last, I believe, in the last three years. So we, we've uh, suffered a large increase under the present regulatory scheme and inability to, to further regulate rates. But the, the particular uh, need that we have is, is when we're able to get out of our existing contractual agreements. We just lost a lawsuit and all the lawsuits sought to do, uh, all we sought to do was to increase our, our minority uh, uh, participation of our company and, and we did also want to know why it was that in December of last year when Miami had a very, very unusual uh, cold wave, one of the few that we've ever had, the, uh, the weather actually got down to about 40 degrees, you know, which is incredible for us. Um, we had thousands of outages, thousands of outages just from power shortages and then the power surge apparently that la later went through the line. Uh, and, and then they didn't have any equipment ready for that. Now they're beginning to, out they're beginning to outfit their, their uh, system for, to handle that contingency. Why didn't they have that uh, in mind before? I guarantee you around renewal time, as Mayor James was saying, uh, we'll be there uh, uh, requiring all of the uh, customer service standards. We'll be uh, keeping an eye on rates uh, if you give us that authority. Uh, and if you share it with us, and um, and and that the rates have increased though substantially. Let me let me say that it's in it's in our testimony. Well, yes, and, and, but I, and I would imagine that the uh, figures that I have here are correct. Uh, Nineteen dollars ninety five cents for four channels of basic uh, uh, cost in, in Miami, and, and and you mentioned before something about uh, you could not get any other bidders. Well, one of the problems may be that there's only 28 percent penetration uh, in uh, the city of Miami, which does not make it really uh, cost effective. I'll tell you this, I, I, I'm paying more than $19 myself. I'm paying about $23 for the basic service, so I don't know if the rates there are a little bit uh, outdated. Um, I, I uh, also tell you that we have uh, a channel that transmits the uh, Miami Heat uh, basketball games, and we can't get our company to, to reach an agreement with them to transmit our games. So we, we have the funny situation that I have to go to other jurisdictions to watch our own basketball team, uh, and we have no ability to force them to carry that channel, which in our community is uh, a sports channel. We can't get it in, in, in any, not only in the basic service, we can't get it in any tier for any price. And again, uh, as to the rates, uh, I gave you the figures of almost 100 percent increase in the last five years. Mr. Congressman. Yes. Uh, I've also noticed that there are two other factors that also drive the rising costs that have nothing to do with just the question of more service and more channels. We've noticed that a lot of times the increase in cable service is due to the fact that a company will buy it and because they view it as a pork barrel, uh, they hold it for two years and sell it. For instance, Gateway Cable in Newark, 15 million franchise, sold for 30 million, and now Gateway Cable is on the market in 1990. Uh, having made that purchase, Mr. Gilbert family for $30 million is attempting to sell it for $80 million. Now, when you buy it for 30 and sell it for 80, who will pick up the cost? And we've noticed that there's a correlation where you roll over that increase to the consumers because uh, you have to make up for that, for that debt that you've acquired. The other issue that we've said to you is that, yes, uh, we're paying more and there's been more channels, but it's less quality. For instance, when you first uh, had the basic package in Newark, you had CNN, you had black entertainment uh, television, you had Discovery, and you had MTV. All of that since has moved out. The numbers have increased in the basic package, but the quality of those programs in the basic package has been altered. So our suspicion and, 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 and summary would be that you are getting less quality, although you're getting more, okay. or you're getting less quality and you're paying more. Yeah, some of those are uh, under extended basic uh, at this point in time. I, I want to get to one other point here uh, before my time runs out, and this is on the franchise fees. Uh, I have one figure here, and I'm not sure it's exactly right, but uh, Mayor Schmoke, uh, Baltimore uh, uh, 
last year in 1990 received in franchise fees $1.9 million, uh, of which it can be used for anything, not only just overseeing uh, the cable, but uh, for whatever else you want to use it for, and you can charge up to 5% of uh, a yearly uh, gross revenues for that. Uh, the question I have is, uh, uh, do you charge 5%? And if you do reduce the 5% charge, it has to go back to the reduction in the customer rates. Well, we have, uh, those, those figures are uh, correct. Just check one moment on the 5%. Yes, the overall figures are correct, and we have used the um, uh, franchise fee to uh, provide other services, particularly educational information services that affect our, our public schools and uh, uh, other um, uh, public services through government and in, in institutional, um, we're developing an institutional network here in our, our community. Um, we do have, I think, we have had a very good relationship in the last two years uh, with the local operator on the rate issue. That's why I, uh, in, in my testimony, did not make a, uh, spend a great deal of time on the rate question. There were other issues, however, on, uh, as it relates to services and billing and things of that nature to the uh, public and quality of, of service to specific individuals where we don't have any impact whatsoever until it gets around to the, uh, the end of the uh, franchise renewal. So we do have a, a, a relationship that I think uh, justifies having a proclamation. I would not have given that proclamation three years ago. However. I understand. I'd like to ask the other uh, mayors, uh, do, do all of you charge up to five, the full 5%? Anyone not charge 5% of the franchise gross revenue? Anyone not? You know, I, I have to admit that I don't know the answer, but if I may just say one last thing on your prior question of penetration, Congressman, it's very important to, to, to illustrate why the penetration is not higher in our community. If you uh, could get the broadcast channels as you can in Miami, obviously, from only Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and some other uh, neighboring uh, broadcast uh, stations um, for, for zero, and you're being asked to pay $60 for installation and $20 to get the, the only thing that you get in our basic service that you would want to get really is CNN. Uh, we don't get Disney Channel, uh, for example, for the kids. Uh, you obviously don't get any of the, of the uh, movie channels. Um, and, and you get a lot of county commission meetings and a lot of city commission meetings that a lot of people would pay money not to get at their home. And uh, so the, the equation is very simple for the average guy out there. Am I going to pay $20 a month plus $60 installation fee to get CNN? That's what it comes down to. That's the only thing. That's, we're talking basic service. I mean, very basic. I'm sorry. There's also C-SPAN, and uh, I guess they get to see the Congress well, there. So I'm sure they'd pay for that. Right? I'm sorry. Gentlemen's time. The broadcast I'm, is really competition after all. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. Chair, will recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. My feeling is consumers are not dumb. Regardless of the gobbledygook they're fed sometimes about re-tiering really being a discount for senior citizens and things like that, re-tiering is a price increase for most all cable consumers. For the mayor of Shovel, it was a 19 percent price increase. The cable companies know that the basic package really amounts to just retransmission of existing network television, which is free if you have an antenna free. It's not a bargain to get something for $12 a month that is free if you have an antenna. And as has been pointed out, I don't think the addition of C-SPAN or City Council News is going to make people all excited about the basic package. What you're seeing is a migration of the valued channels to the highest cost tier, and they're migrating them as fast as they can migrate them. And unfortunately, even some of our business publications, like Business Week, I was noticing in the March 25, 1991 article, article entitled Clever, Those Cable Companies, the article implies that the re-tiering is taking place without price increases already. But as this hearing has demonstrated, the price increases are already occurring, and they're about to be even bigger. I just learned that not only does this help cable companies' bottom line today, 
It also, as I understand it, even helps them with their copyright charges because apparently those are calculated on the basic service. If you can reduce your basic revenues, you pay less in copyright. I'm not an expert on cable company accounting, but let's not fool ourselves into thinking that the cable companies are all of a sudden turning warm-hearted and trying to help all their subscribers out there. It's not true. The benefits of competition, I realize, will probably never reach small-town America, at least not in my lifetime. I think they're capable of helping many of our major markets. We will need regulation in smaller markets because I have a, a district that today isn't even serviced by traditional telephone companies. The phone company didn't want my district, so it's unlikely that startup cable companies are going to seek us out. But when you look at the benefits that competition could provide today and is providing in the few markets that have competition, you look at a place like Glasgow, Kentucky. Our Senate colleagues discovered this last week. Glasgow, Kentucky is served by Telescripts Cable Company. It is surrounded by other Telescripts locations without competition. And in those markets without competition, the rates vary from $17 to $20. But in Glasgow, Kentucky, where finally there is competition, guess what rates went down to? $8.95. $8.95, a cut of 50% or so. Other charges went down. The remote control charge went down from $4.95 a month to $0.95 cents a month. The outlet charge for each TV went down from $3.50 a month to $1 a month. The premium channel charge went down from $11.95 a month to $7.95 a month. Even local access programming is improving because now there are two folks competing to cover Little League games and things like that. You might feel sorry for the cable company and say, oh, those poor folks, they're losing money in Glasgow, Kentucky. Well, if you can believe their own attorney, an attorney who I think should be praised for being honest, but who'll probably be, be relieved of her duties for having spoken the truth, she says they are not losing money at eight ninety five a month, quote, but they're not getting the profit they used to get. <laughs> she goes on to say that when a cable company is the only one in town, you can charge whatever the market will bear. I think this lady deserves our commendations for having been honest about the situation. But the truth is, as I said, most every community in America could cut cable rates in half and the cable company could still make a profit. We want them to make a profit. What we don't want is exploitation of our consumers, consumers who are not dumb. And they've been fed gobbledygook on this panel and other panels in the Congress for at least four years now, if not seven years. They are tired of it. They realize the mayor's hands are tied. You guys are pleading to us for help. We should help you. We shouldn't keep you in the box that you're in. Living on a daily basis with folks who are outraged with this abuse. So I hope that this year, finally, we will take action to help you. Because, as I said in my opening statement, we could cut cable rates in half nationwide. We could save consumers as much as $6 billion a year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Tennessee went to Harvard, just so you'll know, uh, for the <laughs> record. And uh, we... Uh, uh, so when you go to Harvard, sometimes what winds up is that your question sometimes takes the form of answers. And uh, <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> think of that as a rhetorical question that was answered. Um, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Oxley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, to all of the mayors uh, present, uh, welcome uh, particularly to my uh, new friend, uh, Mayor Suarez uh, from Miami. Uh, we did indeed have a discussion, Mr. Chairman, about uh, whether we should go up to Baghdad and get rid of that guy that's caused all the problems up there. But the mayor said, Mike, just let CNN take care of Peter Arnett. <laughs> but uh, I just stole that from the president. He used that line last night. He, he got a bigger laugh than I did. Uh, let me uh, ask the, uh, the mayors, uh, as I understand, a, a 
total of about $800 million was paid uh, in franchise fees uh, to the various cities uh, last year by the uh, cable operators. Uh, we've heard uh, from uh, one of the, the mayors in regard to that uh, and how specifically that's uh, uh, distributed. Uh, I wonder if the other mayors could give us some idea as to how those franchise fees uh, are, uh, are distributed. And secondly, uh, what uh, if in fact uh, all of you are at the 5% uh, uh, ceiling? Uh, Mayor Feldhaus, would you uh, give us some information on that? Well, I'm not exactly sure as to what our percentage rate is on our franchise fee, but I do know the figure is about $35,000 that the city of Shelbyville collected last year uh, from the cable franchisee. The uh, one use, I mean, besides general government expenses that some of these others have had is just there is a basic rent if you permit right-of-way use within your municipality. If we're responsible for maintaining those right-of-ways, it seems like to me we should at least be getting some sort of revenues to help us with that. Because I know our street department budget and that type thing approaches $600,000 a year, which is not much money to some of these big guys, but us smaller fellows, that $35,000 does help us to maintain those right-of-ways, which they have free access uh, over ahead and underground. But essentially that you have the wide open choice as to how you wish to use those revenues. Is that correct? That's true. Yes. Uh, Mayor I, Smoke? Yeah. I, the one thing I, for, I failed to mention in the uh, discussing our use of the franchise fee, uh, we do charge up to the, uh, the 5 percent. And um, besides uh, some of the other uh, public uh, services that are provided using the, uh, the franchise uh, fee, that is the educational programming, the uh, broadcast, the various uh, hearings at council, as Mayor Suarez talked about. We also use money uh, to um, uh, hire uh, staff members for the Mayor's Office of Cable and Communication to address complaints um, because of the fact that the local operators' uh, complaint operation had been in pretty bad shape uh, two years ago, but now has uh, substantially improved. I mentioned my oral uh, testimony that we were receiving somewhere between 175, 180 complaints a month uh, the, uh, and, and we use staff from, from the mayor's office to try to help out the uh, cable operator, but uh, that with the new, the new uh, management at the um, company, the cable company, that's been reduced to about 100 operated, but uh, that with the new, the new uh, management at the um, company, the cable company, that's been reduced to about 100 complaints a month. But we have used some of our franchise fees for that purpose. Mayor James. Congressman, we charge less than 5 percent. It's only 2 percent in what we call the public utility right away because we had to assist the franchise where they want to go in the back, locate the front. Some neighborhoods say we don't want wires in the front. The municipality have to assist them going into the back and then also the question of going in the ground. But I think it's, a, it's an even more important question because in 1972, to go along with the question that we we're talking about a dual uh, responsibility, in 1972 when Mayor Gibson had been elected to 1970, our city had been one-third wired and I sat in a room as a councilman then and we said we want 15 to 20 percent feeling our oats as he was then the first uh, Afro-American mayor of a major East Coast city. And the company said, we can't do that. And they walked away from the city of Newark. And it took another 15 years later before we had cable TV. So there's clear evidence that if you have a municipality who's abusive, uh, they will suffer as well as the question of, of a bad cable operator as well. Thank you. Mayor. Congressman, in, in Pennsylvania, uh, counties don't charge franchise fees. The individual municipalities do. Uh, there are 38 municipalities in my, uh, in my uh, county, and uh, several of them, I'm aware of what they do with some of their fees. They do provide grants back, just like my county does, even though we don't receive any, uh, any of those fees, provide grants back to the local uh, public TV channel uh, to provide uh, community interest type programming. Thank you. Mayor Suarez. Congressman, I didn't check the, the fee that we're actually charging, but if we're allowed 
if we're allowed 5 percent, I suspect we're charging 4.99999 at infinitum. Uh, you may round it out to 5. Um, but it is a small amount. They're getting the right of way, the use of a right of way, a rather nice right of way, if I may add. Um, like any other utility, uh, I think the, f the, the fee is actually small. We use it uh, for any and all purposes, as we would do any other uh, franchise fee. We probably bond it out in some cases. I think in the case of, of cable, though, we have to spend almost all of it just to run our cable office. Our uh, one single uh, administrative employee and, and some secretaries and so on to take all the complaints we get, I, I think it was in the uh, 20,000 a year range, which is a substantial percentage of our entire cable uh, subscribership. And uh, in that one month, uh, we had thousands in that one month when that one outage uh, took place over a, a rather prolonged period of time. So, you know, once again, it, it, you know, 5 percent is not a, a high amount, and, and it probably, in our case, and I can get you those figures subsequent to the testimony, I'd like to uh, try to prove to you that most of it is used just uh, policing the system. I'd appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Chairman would ask uh, that the record be left open if the mayors would care to respond uh, in some detail. Let me just close with asking uh, just a general question. There have been some uh, members uh, who have suggested that uh, a lot of their, a lot of uh, our constituents really don't know the uh, amount that they are paying indirectly through franchise fees uh, that re are reflected on their bills. And there have been some uh, among us who suggest that, uh, including the gentleman from Virginia who was unable to be here this morning, uh, that uh, the uh, a line item uh, appear on the uh, bills from the cable uh, indicating uh, how much of the individual's bill uh, was reflected in franchise fees. Uh, do you have any comments as to uh, the uh, uh, applicability of that? Anybody? I wouldn't mind my folks seeing that uh, all we get is a dollar out of the 20. No problem against that, Congressman. Yeah, the the um, company in Baltimore has that authority. Um, if they choose to do it, they can do it. So we wouldn't have any objection. They have not chosen to do that at, at this point, though? They have not chosen to do that. Mayor? I wouldn't have any problem showing our tax. I mean, our, the public's books are wide open. I just like would, would like to see the cable company's books examined as closely, because if we can get the same basic rate, like in Glasgow, Kentucky, for nine bucks, why do they charge us a 200 percent increase if we're going to get hung up on percentages? Maybe they ought to charge what their profit is on there also. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Gentlemen's authority. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, uh, let me ask you, uh, if you know, what was your, your community's reaction to deregulation during that, let's say, 1984 and then the period, that gap between 1984 when the act was passed and 87 when it went into effect? What, do, you, do you know what your community's reaction was at that time? I, I go back, I was not uh, on this committee at the time, but uh, I, I seem to feel that, uh, uh, going on recollection, that an awful lot of communities in the country just were kind of glad to get rid of the, the headache, the problem really, that they weren't, uh, you know, we, we're talking about the big cities uh, uh, maybe having the resources, but the little communities, Tarpon Springs, Florida, and some of these other communities, uh, Mr. Feldhaus's community, if you will, and some others, uh, the headaches uh, that they really had at the time. And there was, I think there was a relief among many of them at that point in time. Uh, now um, uh, you basically come back just a few years later and tell us you think you want to get back to that. Now, I don't know whether you, there is a relief in your community or among your, your city governments. Uh, Congressman. Uh, can, can you answer that yeah, for me? Well, as, uh, as far Mr. as Baltimore, uh, uh, we were in an unusual situation because we didn't have cable before the effective date of the uh, act. We, uh, uh, our franchise agreement was signed, I believe, December of 1984. And so um, I, I can't give you the, the sense of at least this, that local community before. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I think, Congressman, during that period after deregulation, you had the greatest rate increases. We've talked about uh, 86 through 89 until today. You had the greatest amount whereby the service, you just, they just don't answer the telephone. Uh, just yesterday, I called a company before coming here to get data, and I allowed the phone to ring one hour. Then finally, I drove to the cable company just to get a copy of my home bill and in case you want to know how many we have. So I think you just find that once they felt free 
Uh, they've just taken well, off. But how did, yes, sir, but, uh, but let's go back, though. How did the community feel about deregulation when deregulation first took place? Uh, in other words, was there, was there a, re a relief that it was no longer the responsibility and the headache of the, of the community because of the de deregulation aspect? Uh, I think there was a certain... You, you may not know. Uh, you, you may well, not we, have been we had it at that time, that. Mike. Uh, I think there's a euphoria f followed by the realities that, that we're there out of it now. euphoria, yeah. though, initially. Is that right? Right, right. Mayor uh, Suarez, I, the, the rest of you gentlemen, I certainly don't mean to preclude the rest of you. I think there was, uh, there was a certain ambivalence that prevailed in my community. Um, elected officials that I spoke to at that time on the issue felt a sense of relief. Okay, God, we don't have to deal with this. That wasn't quite true. Uh, the complaints didn't stop just because the regulation stopped. The, the, the complaints continued. Now you have a frustrated elected official because he's still getting the calls and the complaints, and he has absolutely no control over that industry. Um, he has no way to respond to his constituents' complaints. It creates that frustration, and you have constituents that are, you know, frankly, they, they question um, the, the, uh, the honesty of the official. Well, if you can't do it, then who can? And unfortunately, then we have to refer them to you folks. Well, Mayor, uh, with all due respect, I'm told, and it, I'm told that I haven't had an opportunity to read your testimony, uh, that uh, your deal with your cable operators is, is an oral deal, handshake? No. It, uh, uh, it's, it's written? In, uh, actually, counties do not franchise uh, cable television in Pennsylvania. It's the individual oh. municipality. Okay. And they have their contracts right, uh, so, with them. Uh, you, you can't really, all right. Uh, Mayor Suarez, when is the, um, what was the date that you, that the, the city of Miami entered into the latest cable uh, uh, license with its current operator or operators? Congressman, our chronology is very interesting. Uh, by the way, we've never had euphoria in relation to cable service. Uh, the two things were inconsistent in our community, actually. We, uh, we got our franchise just a couple of years before uh, uh, deregulation. Up to that point, the problems had been installation, the damage done to homes and the disruption and the bad installation, et cetera, and minority participation. That's what people were concerned about. Um, then at around uh, the time of deregulation, what we had was basically uh, service and then, of course, very quickly rate complaints. And uh, so in our particular case, there would, be, there would be absolutely nothing positive that resulted from deregulation. All right. But what and I, I think we're, I'm sorry, to answer your final question, I think we're, we're like two or three years away from uh, renewal. Two or three years away yes. from renewal. And we'd love to have all of the options open. I, I think that, I think Congressman Cooper maybe uh, referred to it before. If you have a, a community like ours, a fairly large, fairly dense community, and uh, we had the ability to uh, foster competition and, and at the same time to, to uh, impose as many minimum standards and, uh, as we possibly could, uh, we were given a free reign to do that, I, I suspect the rates will be infinitesimal with, uh, with the initial fixed cost already absorbed by the existing franchise if we can get uh, any competitors to, to share in the trunk lines uh, technologically, which I think we could do. So I, I think that $20 is an incredible price to pay on a monthly basis. Uh, uh, with, the, with the installation charge, the first year you're talking $300. A lot of people can't afford that in our community. Any, have any of your, the communities uh, that you gentlemen represent uh, uh, renewed uh, within the last three years, let's say? No? Sir, our, our, in Baltimore, the um, yeah. agreement was uh, what, signed 15, in 80. 15 years? Yeah, go to, to, to 20 years. 20 years. But when, you, when, you, when it's time for you to renew, Mayor, under, under the current uh, law, Correct. if there are no changes made. We would, uh, we would simply write in all the things that we hope to uh, try to, to achieve under uh, great. All right, Correct. all right. You you would do that at the time. You would renew. Correct. Are you precluded from making modifications or, or trying to make modifications at this point in time? There are certain. Correct. At at this time, because of the agreement, 
we can sit down and negotiate it. We can propose and negotiate with the operator, but we cannot mandate. Well, you can't mandate. Uh, uh, it, would that be a fair negotiation, a fair, a fair uh, uh, discussion, a, 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 bargain, uh, a bargaining uh, session, if you will? Uh, uh, could the, the cable operator uh, unilaterally basically say, we refuse to talk to you in terms of modifying? Well, it, it's unlikely that this particular operator would be that cavalier um, because of the, um, uh, they, they have in the last few years been fairly sensitive to, um, to our uh, request for, for a modification for being, for responding to consumer complaints and things of that nature. Would it be, could they, however, yes, they could if they wanted to simply not show up at, at meetings, not appear, at, at hearings if they wanted to, but uh, uh, I, I don't think that that would, uh, that would occur. Now, on the other hand, there are certain things that we've asked for already as it relates to uh, adjustments to technology, uh, particularly with uh, people getting these new cable-ready televisions, uh, that uh, we have had one-way conversations. Uh, with respect to uh, with respect to that, and and obviously, if we had greater competition, they would be more responsive. Well, uh, you know, you all keep harping on this competition, and uh, uh, I'm not sure that I I quite understand why how, where deregulation would be very helpful in so far as competition is concerned, because you can bring in if they're willing uh, another operator now. Uh, if they're not willing to do it under the current circumstances because it's not feasible money-wise, they've got to lay new lines, et cetera, et cetera. And the concerns that one of you voiced uh, uh, about uh, maybe stepping on and, and injuring or some way destroying current lines, that would exist in any case whether you had uh, uh, regulation or deregulation. So I'm not really sure that deregulation would help the competition aspect. As a matter of fact, uh, the high rates that you refer to using your terms, uh, would almost seem to foster uh, the possibility, at least, maybe not the probability, the possibilities of another operator maybe thinking about coming into the area because he might, get, he might feel he can get a decent rate of return because, after all, you're talking about a high rate with a current operator, and if we go just a little below him, uh, we might be able to get some of those... Uh, Congressman, I think all of us are agreeing with your general philosophy that the, the best approach in, in this matter would be to have the greatest amount of competition. But what we're suggesting is that it doesn't appear to be developing, and yet there are abuses out there that we receive complaints about we can't respond to. And so until we get to this, this point where there's the, the free market is really working as, as well as it should, we have to deal with a monopoly, yeah. well, and Mayor, most monopolies, I think, are controlled Mayor, by some I, regulation. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about a the deregulation has been in effect for what four years. My gosh, are, are we have we really given given it the opportunity to do maybe some of the things that we would like to see it do? Four years period of time. I, I, I I'm not sure about that, uh, but I know my time. I see the chairman ready to to hit the gavel, and I know my time is basically up. And, and I would ask one thing from you, uh, sort of to, to maybe uh, tack on to or hitchhike upon what uh, Mr. Rinaldo asked you earlier, and that is, uh, what changes would you suggest might be made to the current Cable Act that would give you the, uh, uh, maybe broaden the scope uh, that, uh, of, of your regulatory authority, basically. Uh, you don't want to be like the idea of being tied into these 15 and 20 year deals. I might submit to you that you, the cities, entered willingly into those 15 or 20 year deals. Nobody twisted your arm to do it. Uh, but at the same time, you may feel that the Cable Act is not broad enough to allow you to maybe escape from those deals, if you will. Uh, so uh, I would ask you maybe to submit uh, to, for the record, and basically this is maybe the same thing that Congressman Rinaldo was asking for, what changes, without deregulation, if you will, what changes would you suggest might be made to the Act to give you this broader authority to be able to maybe have a little better control within those 15, 20-year license period. The league, the league and the, 
the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the National League will be more than happy, Congressman, to submit that data. And in reference to your earlier question, we're here after this short period of time because of the complaints and because of the abuses. It's a short period of time. Uh, if this time had not been abused by the cable industry, uh, then we would not be here. So we're here as a voice for the people uh, calling for reform uh, needed during this time and greater control and legislation by the Congress uh, to ensure that the people are not, shall we say, abused even during a short period of time. The length of a municipal contract is an individual item uh, between that municipality yeah. and the cable industry, and I don't think it's... Well, but most of these franchise agreements uh, um, existed prior to, to the Act. Correct. Uh, all right. So, uh, uh, Again, we can't really blame the act necessarily as it is now for these poor, as, from your viewpoint, uh, franchise agreements, and I think we've got to keep that into consideration. But again, the Congress is, is concerned, that the, you know, the people tell the government what to do and not the other way around, and so it is very significant that we get your testimony, but I'd also like to get some specifics from you in we terms will give of that. maybe we will have that data changes to the act. Uh, we're going short of deregulation, if you will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, the gentleman's time has expired. The chair would recognize itself for uh, five minutes. Let me ask um, each of you to respond to a very fundamental question. I opposed the deregulation of cable in 1984 when it passed the House, and I'm, uh, I'm a populist Democrat and don't mind regulating in, in a situation such as this seemed to be then. But I do have some uh, concerns now about the fact that there seems to be an awful lot of alternatives out there. This uh, MMDS, I uh, still don't know what that stands for, but it's apparently wireless cable. Uh, I understand is now in a lot of the urban areas. Uh, is, it's held out as though it's a form of competition for the cable uh, companies. There's also an enormous number of over-the-air stations and public TV comes over the station, rental movies, all kinds of other things. I'm wondering about the basic justification for regulation uh, at all. It, assuming in a city that you can get the three networks, or maybe the four networks, depending on what you call Fox, and assuming you can have access to uh, uh, an MMDS alternative, what, if, if you don't like it or it costs too much, why can't you just turn it off? Let me just start with Mayor Swattis and go to the right. I think there's a bit of a, a misconception in the terminology that we're using, and I wanted to respond to the congressman uh, from my state and, and, and to respond to you uh, also. If we had the regulatory ability to set, for example, maximum fees at the time of not renewal, we keep calling it renewal, we'd like to see rebidding. I mean, the, the, the presumption that exists for the same franchise continuing on is, is the one that's killing us, even at the time of, we keep calling it renewal, I like to see uh, rebidding. But if we had the ability to set the maximums, a lot of small towns and so on uh, perhaps would be benefited. In our particular case, we would do what we do for any public works contract. We would have an idea of the fee that we're willing to accept and then we would uh, let the world compete for it. We could throw out all the, the bids at the end of the process if we don't like it. And uh, we would be substantially below, I am sure, whatever ceiling we impose. But we have to have the ability to, to have the fee regulation. We have to have the ability to uh, as much power as you can give us at uh, renewal time, for lack of a better term, to, to do a true competitive bidding. And uh, the two things work hand in hand. One is not in any way contradictory to the other. I, I wonder why we've gotten into the, the notion that rate regulation somehow is uh, contradictory to competition. It can foster it if, if applied correctly. And I think the ones of us that are here have learned from our existing agreements that we're saddled by and that we're not too wise in the first place uh, that, that how to do it around uh, rebidding time. Well, I, I want to reemphasize that my question gets to the fact that it's, or at least the inquiry as to whether or not it's not appropriate to say if you want to overcharge everybody and run the price way up, well, go right ahead. The consumer can just not watch it. Assuming in your areas you do have over-the-air channels, and an adequate number of them, and this MMDS, or these other types of, uh, of, of pay television, yeah. I think <clears throat> cable today to the, to the people that have it has become more than just entertainment. It's become almost uh, a necessity. It's a major source of uh, news and information for a lot of people. Uh, it's education for children. It's uh, seeing your, your local government in action. 
Um, because some people uh, do occasionally turn on uh, county council uh, out of curiosity to see what we're doing. Uh, the question of the alternatives uh, and some of the competing technologies uh, is interesting, but some of them are very expensive. If, I, if, I'm, if I'm correct, and I'm not an expert on the technologies, uh, but uh, bringing these costs or these uh, new technologies into the home at this point is rather expensive. Uh, the MMDS, if, if I'm correct, you're looking at several hundred dollars to bring that into the, into the household. There are going to be people that can't afford that. Um, it's one of the reasons NACO took the position to, to uh, endorse uh, telco entry with uh, safeguards. Well, let me ask you, in your urban area, do you have uh, three or four channels over the air at least that uh, are free? Yeah, you can get probably, uh, since we're, we're exposed to both uh, the Philadelphia media and the New York media, you can probably get five or six. Plus probably an educational channel, right? A public television? Yeah, channel? there there is an educational TV channel available there. That's something a few, 40 years ago, everyone would have thought was miraculous. You know, I just wonder about this conversion that all of a sudden we've got to have that cable in our house. Well, I think I think because of the it's it's going to be more than just just like what I said entertainment in the future you're going to be able to do so much with cable uh, you'll be providing medical services to, uh, via cable uh, to people uh, who cannot leave their homes to people in remote areas who may not have access to that service uh, I just believe if we make the wrong choices now as a country uh, we're going to fall behind and it's Technologically, this is going to be a, a second-class uh, uh, nation, and we, I don't believe we can afford to do that. Okay. Mayor James? <clears throat> Congressman, I, I know it's easy to say turn it off or turn in your converter, but I think, if anything, we come out of the recent war uh, with smart missiles and, and the military might of America, and today's New York Times, they talk about the Japanese buying all films about the war because they're very impressed with America's technology clear evidence that we live during an era of technology and communication. And I think if we have smart missiles, we now must have a smart and enlightened population, must have smart students. And I recall a Secretary of State saying, well, where'd you get your information from? He said, I watch CNN. Well, unless you have cable TV, unless you buy the second tier in the city of Newark, you couldn't watch CNN to get any information. I think if we can free Kuwait, then we can free the cable industry and make it more accessible to people and millions of Americans. I think that's the challenge we have. Smart missiles, the era of technology and communication, it has become an essential item for all America if we're going to have an enlightened and learned population. So I would like to see Congress, with that mandate, make it more available. Senior citizens on fixed incomes should not be forced to choose between heating and eating, and now it's heating, eating, and whether you want cable TV, and if you can buy the second or third tier. So I would hope that we have a greater sensitivity uh, to the population. Graying America, the senior citizens, the sick, the aged, and our students who need communication and technology. Well, I want you to understand, I, I share the general spirit, but uh, my inquiry is really <laughs> about whether you can't watch, I'm, I'm sure in Newark you can probably get 12 stations over the air. I don't know, in that metropolitan area there. Uh, so you have so many alternatives. I mean, a person can read a book. I mean, it, it's... Well, it's I, I, I said earlier, Colin, with a coat hanger, I can get 26, but it's not the ones I want. Okay. Mayor Schmoke? Yeah. I um, Congressman, I was just trying to think um, about how many we, stations we actually get over the year, and I think it's about seven in our area with the decent antenna, um, then you hook into the Washington area, and so that, that increases a, a little bit um, a little bit more with a public, a public uh, station and the various networks. I think Mayor James is correct in uh, picking up on what Councilman Sifter was saying about this movement of the, uh, of the industry. Uh, cable is becoming more and more essential. We're using it for a, a wide variety of educational programs from the elementary and secondary level to the university 
uh, level and hopefully those educational services will become more uh, available to, um, uh, to citizens in our, our community. So it's not just the entertainment uh, aspect. Uh, our um, community is a, it's a city of about 750,000 people and uh, apparently uh, these costs now are um, considered by many uh, uh, of our citizens extremely significant. I mentioned before that our cable uh, operator only has a 35 percent penetration right now. At one time they tried, I think it was fairly recently, they tried to hike basic fees by $1.50 and just that $1.50 led to a, uh, a loss of uh, 2,000 people dropping uh, the service. Um, now, uh, maybe, you know, on one hand that's an argument for uh, allowing the, the market to, to take care of, its, uh, uh, of this operation. Uh, on the other hand, I think there is a need, not only in rates, but in, in other aspects of the service, for government to be able to step in and regulate it uh, uh, more substantially than it has in the past. Okay. Mayor Feldhouse? I think basically in our small communities we have a couple of problems with trying to foster uh, competition, which is what we'd all like to see. Uh, you may look at it from a national level and you see all these cable companies out there and it looks like they're competing, but when you get down to small rural America like our community, which has not even been approached by anyone willing to come in and compete, or a situation where you have a small entrepreneur who, wish, who does install cable in a small community of, the, of, our, re, of our county or not within our city limits, they haven't because of the franchise agreement, but within our county, and eventually they start growing and going and expanding, all of a sudden they're gobbled up. And it just seems like there's this, there is this country club mentality or country club agreement mentality that uh, they're not going to come in and compete. And we being the small guys, literally we were told when we did our re franchise agreement a couple years ago that this is what you're being offered and you really don't have much choice even though it was publicly notif notice was sent that you know we were doing this and no one ever inquired uh, we were just stuck and thank yeah. thank goodness they were I guess they were willing to pay us our five percent do you have over the air channels that uh... yes we have uh, four over the air channels one UHF channel that you can get all out of Nashville but we're out a ways in some areas you really have to put an antenna up a lot higher than this ceiling to get the signal. Uh, but we do have those and that would fall under the current FCC requirements and even under the new. If uh, with their new re-tiered rate we would still fall under their new guidelines as far as having uh, competition. But the not the 10 channels that was under the budget cable tier, which was so-called to help our fixed income and senior citizens, two of those are shopping channels, which I think get paid by the cable company to actually carry them. Mm -hmm. Five of them are those local over-the-air stations. The only two, and one of them is C-SPAN, the only two we got was WGN out of Chicago and WTBS out of Atlanta. Now they've got it written on this page and it looks pretty slick, is 13 channels. Two of those channels are marked future use. So I don't know what future use is, but right now we don't have anything on them. So <laughs> they imply 13 channels. And then, they, and then you flip the page and they start with channel 14 all the way to 36 with the next tier level. And that looks like, oh wow, I'm getting another 22 channels. But if you look at it, it, there's no channel 18, there's no channel 20, 21, 22, there's no channel, uh, well then it goes on up 36. So they're skipping a lot of channels in there. And so we have less than what one member said earlier of the 30 channels. We don't have near 30, we have 23 channels. Well I'm sympathetic channels. with the comments everybody's made. It just occurs to me that, uh, uh, and I'm quite ready to regulate any monopoly anywhere. It might be a good idea if sometimes folks just uh, turned off the TV at night and talked to the other people that live in the house there with them and read a book. <laughs> uh, my time's expired. John last. Okay, great. Gentlemen, we uh, thank you very much for your uh, testimony today, for your uh, patience, your contribution. As we move along over the next uh, uh, several months, we're clearly going to need to be in close contact with uh, each of you and the 
associations which you represent in order to uh, uh, guarantee that we have a full understanding of your concerns and help to negotiate the tensions that exist uh, in this area between all the various interests. And we're going to need your uh, support and your help in uh, pushing forward a piece of legislation. And we'd hope that we could. Uh, uh, the data requested by the subcommittee, Mr. Chairman, we will have the League and the U.S. Conference of Mayors forward that data to you as quickly as possible. Thank you very much, Major. Thank you all Thank you. very much. Honored to have all of you. Thank you. And, uh, and now we'll move on to uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the second uh, panel, which uh, just consists um, of, uh, of a single extremely distinguished uh, American, uh, the uh, Honorable Al Sykes, who is the chairman of the Federal Communications uh, Commission. <clears throat> we have um, um, a um, br brief delay here for a few seconds while uh, the last panel uh, moves away from the <clears throat> witness table. And um, we'll then be able to move on to uh, this witness, which uh, uh, who has the, the, the superior expertise in the area of, uh, of monitoring of this uh, area. And uh, we very much appreciate his uh, patience uh, and cooperation in participating today. <clears throat> the, uh, um, the committee, uh, first of all, Mr. Chairman, uh, would like to uh, apologize uh, uh, to you uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the number of members of this uh, subcommittee uh, swells each uh, uh, as each two year period goes by. We're now up to 27 members, which just through the opening statements and the uh, and the round of questions makes it uh, very uh, uh, difficult to conduct the hearing in as streamlined a fashion as possible. But on the other hand, it clearly manifests a tremendous interest which the members of this subcommittee and the members of Congress in general have in the subject. And we appreciate very much your forbearance. And uh, I'd just like to make this one notation, which is that on behalf of the subcommittee, <clears throat> I would like to express appreciation for the FCC's hard work in preparing the Commission's 1990 report on the state of the cable uh, industry. As you know, I differed in several respects on the policy recommendations contained in the report. Uh, because of members' desires to move legislation expeditiously last year, the Commission's report arrived too late in the legislative year to have a meaningful impact on the subcommittee's deliberation. I know that the Commission presently is considering the issue of telephone company provision of video programming. In order for members of the subcommittee and the Congress to obtain the maximum possible benefit from your analysis of this issue this year, I request that you complete and forward to Congress your study on cable telco as expeditiously as possible. Uh, the telco entry issue clearly will be among the priority items before the subcommittee as we address cable legislation. To gain insight into the administration's position on this issue, yesterday I wrote Secretary Mossbacker requesting an early meeting with him. I look forward to learning what specifically the administration has in mind when it says it supports a telco um, entry. And it would be very helpful to us if we could have a, a clear and coordinated uh, signal from the administration, FCC, and Department of Commerce with regard to what that coordinated uh, set of recommendations would be. And uh, if you could help us uh, with regard to an expeditious transmittal of your uh, position, that would be helpful to us. So again, with apologies and with the notation to the subcommittee members that we have an agreement with the chairman that uh, we would try to get him out of here. Uh, approximately uh, at uh, 10 minutes of 1 or thereabouts. Uh, we uh, appreciate your, your appearance and whenever you feel comfortable, welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have, uh, as you noted, uh, a speaking uh, commitment uh, uh, before the land mobile community at, uh, well, it was, it was earlier, but uh, I think if I can get out by 10 to 1, I can 
make that. And I we'll appreciate try. your. And if we could provide you with a cellular phone, perhaps you could stay a little later here and deliver part of your speech on the way over uh, to the to that group. Um, and by the way, congratulations on uh, on. Uh, uh, pirating uh, Terry Haynes away from the uh, the uh, subcommittee. Uh, your uh, substantial gain is our great loss, and we congratulate you on it. And uh, at the same time, bemoan our our own uh, great uh, reduction in uh, cerebral uh, capacity on the uh, subcommittee staff. Good, thank, Whenever thank you feel you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, comfortable, please begin. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on uh, HR 1303. I have submitted uh, more lengthy testimony from the. For the record, we'll abbreviate. Uh, Without objection, it will be included. In the Thank you. Eighteen months ago, I testified before the U.S. Senate on FCC cable television policies. I stressed my strong preference for market-based, not re-regulatory solutions. The 1984 Act should be changed to eliminate the ability of local franchising authorities to grant monopoly franchises. Statutory prohibitions on TV licensees and phone companies providing competing video services should be relaxed. Action should be taken to prevent vertically integrated cable companies from suffocating new competitors in the cable company's home distribution markets. And if Congress legislates mandatory signal carriage, such obligations should be linked to the compulsory license regime. In short, Mr. Chairman, competition in video and other broadband services markets should be allowed to work. The FCC's July 1990 cable report found, first, that cable rates, service quality, and customer responsiveness are positively affected by competition. For example, where there is either direct uh, or yardstick competition, rates on a per-channel basis are some 30 percent below the national average. Second, over-the-air alternatives such as wireless cable or MMDS can be an effective competitive force. Third, there is no evidence consumers gain more from the current monopoly approach than they would from competition. Finally, those findings included in those markets where there is competition, firms are competing on the basis of their technological sophistication. This mirrors experience in other communications markets where competition has proven a reliable spur to technology and innovation. The FCC's July 1990 report did not address possible changes in its 1987 three-signal standard defining effective competition. Following adjournment of the 101st Congress without enactment of cable legislation, however, possible changes were addressed. Our 1991 notice sought comments on a new three-part test. Cable systems would not be regulated if there are six broadcast signals available and cable has less than 50 percent penetration or there is a competing multi-channel provider available to 50 percent of the people in the cable community with 10 percent subscribing, or the cable company satisfies a behavioral test charging no more than competitive rates and complying with the National Cable Television Association's Code of Good Practices. The FCC currently plans to take action in this proceeding in May or June. The pending bill is a matter of concern because it does not address head-on the principal problem, namely legitimated local cable monopolies. Congress has the opportunity in passing new cable legislation to encourage the competition model which has served so well in other communications markets. Such a step would create incentives for technological progress and facilitate the advent of advanced communications networks. This has occurred in the satellite and long-distance markets and competitive upgrades are beginning in the land mobile radio market as well. Several of our trade and technology rivals, most notably Japan and Germany, already have large-scale programs underway. These countries have a tradition of strong government direction and direct involvement in communications. The goal of switched broadband systems is being pursued for the complementary purposes of upgrading national communications capabilities and stimulating domestic demand for high technology products which could then be aggressively exported. In the United States, we have not and need not rely on direct government investment. We do, however, need to eliminate or minimize barriers to competition. At the FCC, we are taking steps to enhance the prospect of competitive MMDS systems. We are close to wrapping up our examination of discriminatory pricing in the satellite delivery or video, of video services 
and this year we will complete our work on examining the rules which limit phone company entry. I unhesitatingly support, I might add, the provision of an enhanced video dial tone. If Congress nevertheless enacts cable legislation along the lines of H.R. 1303, steps should be taken to provide the FCC with the budget resources needed to administer the new law. We estimate five-year costs of $27.7 million in the Congressional Budget Office estimates a cost of $23 million. American experience in communications demonstrates that competition can, in function, can function as an effective, indeed, superior surrogate for regulation. There is no good ground to assume that the tradition of relying on competition, which has proven so successful in other fields, is inapplicable to cable. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my testimony, and I look forward to answering any questions that the members might have. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Let me begin by recognizing the gentleman from uh, Tennessee, Mr. Cooper, for a round of questions. Am I limited to asking questions, or can I make another speech, Mr. Chairman? Far <laughs> <laughs> it. be it for me to. <laughs> it's the old phrase, you can always tell a Harvard man, but you can't tell him much. So, <laughs> Chairman Sykes, I was discouraged when I saw on your further notice, footnote 9 on page 4, that gives your interpretation of the statute. It's the 1984 Act under which you're bound to operate, in which you conclude that you're permitted rate regulation of only, and you underline only, that tier of service which includes the local broadcast signals. So that really hamstrings the FCC's effort. Substantially, doesn't it? Because, as I pointed out in my earlier remarks, local broadcast service for many, many Americans is free if you have an antenna. So your interpretation of the statute, which may be correct, says you can only determine how much other folks can charge for repackaging something that's free if you have an antenna. I don't think most consumers are going to get all excited about the prospect of FCC relief if that's all you're able to do, you can spill a lot of ink and not help many people if that's the whole ambit of your responsibility. I'm one of those, of course, who agrees you sh should be freed to do more, but I would urge you, if at all possible, to take a broader view of your responsibilities. Uh, be an aggressive uh, bureaucrat, regulator, to test the limits of things if you're going to offer any hope at all to consumers that they might get some sort of rate relief. Do you have any comment? Yeah, I, I think the Cable Act of 1984 is very limiting. Uh, we have, uh, uh, as a part of our notice, uh, suggested this behavioral standard that I made reference to in my testimony. And uh, while, you know, the thinking uh, on that is uh, certainly tentative at this point, uh, I think the benchmark number of channels uh, within the behavioral test was 18. Uh, that would, of course, uh, go beyond uh, simply retransmitted uh, signals. Uh, but again, uh, I think your essential premise is correct, which is that, uh, that the FCC is, is very limited. I might also observe that, that uh, there's, there's virtually no uh, consequential action we take that is not uh, uh, that is not appealed. Uh, for example, two must carry uh, uh, sets of rules have been uh, reversed. And therefore, uh, you know, I do think even though on the one level aggression might be uh, tempting, uh, you know, we certainly on the appellate court level, uh, you know, would, would uh, need to, uh, to hew rather closely to what our grant of authority is and what the record is. And I might, with your indulgence, since I failed to do this in my opening testimony, introduce Roy Stewart, who is the uh, director of our uh, Mass Media Bureau, in case you've got questions that you might like to ask of him, too. Thank you. Thank you. I would agree you need a new statute so that you can have a decent amount of leeway to help consumers. I question whether your behavioral standard is going to do much if the bottom line is, as footnote 9 seems to indicate, you can't touch them unless it's in the basic tier. Uh, the behavioral standard itself raises other questions about a me too standard. You know, if other guys are bad, I can be bad too. That's hardly
going to grant relief to consumers. It just seems to me that we will never, under your procedures, be able, and let me repeat, never be able to offer consumers rate relief such as competition has already provided folks in Glasgow, Kentucky. You cannot ever get your rates down to 895. It doesn't seem to me under any foreseeable scenario with your fear of appeals courts and things like that, and some of those fears are perhaps justified. So I, I, you know, I sat uh, in for the last hour and, I don't know, 15 minutes or so, and I, uh, and I heard your reference to Glasgow, Kentucky, and I'm uh, from just uh, uh, west of Kentucky, you'll recall, and, and know Glasgow, and then asked uh, somebody to favor me with the current uh, population of Glasgow, uh, and it's 34,480 people. And, and I did that for the simple reason that, that I believe that uh, the nature of cable has been transformed in recent years from a retransmission service to a service that has uh, original valued uh, programming uh, to uh, operators that have uh, a large, large inventory of commercial availabilities. You know, this year almost all the advertising uh, revenue is on the decline in the newspaper business, in the television business, in the radio business. The one area where it is not only not on the decline but where it's growing rapidly is in the cable advertising business. And so, you know, if people will pay hundreds of millions for a single channel of television in, in a big market, you know, I really believe in big markets and in the Glasgow Kentuckys, although I think there's a threshold somewhere, uh, there really can be competition. And then if there is competition, I think you and I would agree that far better than any government agency, regardless of how conscientious, that will then tend to force price to true cost and also, uh, you know, the, the installation, uh, the converter boxes, all these add-ons that sometimes are simply disguised price increases aren't going to be, you know, permitted because of the competitive force. Mm -hmm. I would agree with you that we need competition. I am worried, as you point out, for smaller markets it may not be feasible or practicable, at least in the foreseeable future. So regulation is still going to be important, regardless of what your friends in the White House tell you. It also worries me that competition may be a case legislatively of letting the best be the enemy of good. If everyone holds out for competition, perfect competition, the level playing field, we'll probably never pass a bill, period. And six billion dollars a year of consumers' money will continue to go into the coffers of monopolistic cable companies. It pains me to see a good-hearted person like you who's trying to do the right thing so circumscribed it almost leads me to conclude that the FCC effort is a waste of time and money if it is going to accomplish so little other than generate paperwork, so little in the way of real grassroots consumer relief. It might almost be better for all of us if we called a spade a spade and said, it's not worth our time to do this. Let's approach this legislatively. Let's get real competition or decent regulation and do a job instead of being circumscribed by a footnote nine like this. Mm. Uh, my staff urges me for, to note for the record that you're nodding. I don't know whether that's tacit consent or any sort of more open well, consent. Well, foot, footnote nine, of course, is a reflection of the Congressional Act of 1984. Well, that does severely limit you, apparently. But you wouldn't conclude that the FCC effort is unlikely to grant much relief to consumers, and therefore it you might respectfully suggest to this committee that you're wasting your time on that effort? I, I, I would not, of course, uh, uh, just as a matter of... Uh, of uh, Regulatory you know. pride do that. You know. <laughs> no bureaucrat has ever done it in history. I don't see why you should start. I, I, I mean, I, I don't think it is. I don't think it's a waste of time. I, I do, however, agree uh, that, that uh, it is quite limited uh, in the context of your thinking. Well, I hope some of my colleagues, particularly on the other side of the aisle, will understand the limitations that you're aware of in your own proceeding, so they won't hold it out as a panacea or a stopgap measure, or even something that we should wait for in terms of considering our own legislation. I, I think that, you know, I, I really believe that there's a competitions or competition package, I should say, that could be legislated this year that would uh, prohibit the unreasonable refusal to license a second franchisee, that would attack the, the various uh, burdens that are placed on, uh, on uh, incipient competition that tends to suffocate incipient competition, that would require vertically integrated companies in their home distribution markets to provide program access, at least on a transitional basis, and that would uh, have dramatic uh, 
relaxation of the telco entry potential. And I think if that were to happen, I think within 24 months there would be a dramatic set of results because in many markets I think there would be new competition and many other markets there would be the threat of competition right over the shoulder of the cable company. I agree with you. Just let me add one note of caveat. In my informal poll today on this panel, every member but one I spoke to had been offered at least public service announcements on their local cable channel, if not their <laughs> own local cable show. Maybe that will impact their thinking. Maybe it won't. But traditionally, we have had a hard time getting much attention to a $6 billion 50% rate cut consumer issue that even the Consumer Federation of America and the Wall Street Journal seem to agree on. I yield. Well, thank you. If chair. I could just add uh, parenthetically to the gentleman's comment that even if the competition package, which the chairman uh, suggests is uh, possible, although that uh, clearly would have to be uh, negotiated um, legislatively, it would still leave the period of time between. Uh, this year and the time which any particular competitor had entered a new market where we would have to have some regulatory regime in place in order to protect consumers against uh, rate gouging, other abusive practices during that time frame because although it would be nice to think so, theoretical competition uh, can never substitute for real competition. And that therein lies, I think, uh, the, the major difference of opinion uh, which may exist between us. And, um, and if, I, if we could uh, reach some agreement on that, then I think we would have the potential of constructing a very nice package. Let me uh, um, <clears throat> recognize the gentleman from uh, Colorado, Mr. Schaefer. I, uh, thanks, the Chairman. On this competition uh, situation, Mr. Sykes, and I'll try to keep mine short because I know your time constraints. I don't, you were here probably uh, when uh, I was asking questions of Mayor Suarez of, of Miami and uh, why we only have 28 percent penetration in the cable industry, of course, the real answer came out as competition. Six or seven broadcasters uh, were, uh, were operating down there, and, uh, and that was one of the reasons. But this competition thing keeps coming up, and I have a, a great concern on uh, a telco entry into it. I'm understanding that uh, you, uh, you support uh, telco entry. Is that personally you, or is that uh, the commission? I have, I, uh, when I was at NTIA uh, during the period from uh, 1986 uh, through uh, the early part, or I guess the mid part of 1989, uh, we did a report on, on video competition. Uh, and at that point, we recommended uh, what became known as a video dial tone uh, uh, entry approach uh, for the uh, telephone companies. Uh, I'm on record on that. Uh, we have not. Uh, finished up our, our uh, proceeding on the cable telco matter uh, as, as the chairman uh, made reference in his opening statement. Yeah, uh, my understanding was that the commission was not on record as, as favoring this, but you... As favoring you what? In the video uh, dial tone? Yes. Uh, it's never been taken up by the commission, uh, and you will, uh, if you'll survey my testimony, find that I said that I unhesitatingly support yes, an enhanced video dial tone. I understand. So I go beyond my video dial tone recommendation of 1987. Uh, we are supposed to, you're supposed to be coming out with your rulemaking uh, sometime in, uh, in May on the effective competition. Is that correct? That's right. May uh, or June. Okay. Uh, do you have any estimates on what percent of cable systems would be brought under revisions of the effective competition standard, uh, subject and maybe to municipal control? Uh, well, it would depend. It would depend uh, uh, on, in particular, how the definition uh, of uh, of over-the-air signals plus penetration. Um, you know, it will depend on that definition, uh, but, uh, you know, it's my sense that, uh, uh, you know, there would be nothing under a six-signal uh, sort of test, and I think that uh, brings well over 50 percent under, uh, uh, under the uh, rate regulatory scheme that uh, is allowed in the Cable Act of 84. The, uh, the big uh, question a lot of us have is this fiber optics and uh, how uh, well it's going to be used and how it's going to be utilized. Uh, Time Warner just recently announced the construction of a fiber optic based uh, interactive cable system with 150 channels. 
And uh, this is the thing that a lot of us here in Congress were encouraging. Uh, but uh, as a reward, when we look at the possibility of re-regulation, aren't we kind of going backwards if uh, already we're moving into this fiber optics thing? And let's just concentrate on that uh, in itself, if we get into the re-regulation situation, as it was pre-'84. Are we, are we well, going to stem the uh, no, development I of fiber optics? I, I, think, I think there's certainly, there, there certainly the potential if, if, uh, if some sort of, uh, of uh, law was passed that resulted in a, uh, in a real ratcheting down, uh, then I think there would be certainly the potential to, uh, to chill investment, yes. Well, what about the uh, current legislation that we're considering? Uh, would that uh, be reflective uh, on, on this as far as future investment in fiber optics? Difficult to say. The cable industry last year had apparently signed off on something not too dissimilar to what you are currently considering, uh, believing that they needed, uh, you know, a degree of market certainty in order to uh, move forward with investment, uh, and and so you know that would send, tend to be in contradiction with the uh, with the premise. Uh, uh, I, you know, from my standpoint, believe that one of the reasons companies invest is because they are competitively spurred. I don't think AT&T wrote off $5 billion plus in copper plant and moved into fiber uh, because uh, they wanted to uh, do it you know, by fiber rather than by copper. I think they did it because of U.S. Sprint, MCI, and others. And so I would come back and say that if the, if the kind of core uh, objective of this committee or of this Congress is to spur investment, uh, then that comp competition package that I mentioned in response to uh, Congressman Cooper would be the best way to go. Uh, one final question. Uh, is there any reason to believe that uh, per permitting local governments to uh, return to the so-called franchise war days is going to give our consumers better service or lower prices? No, I, I in fact think that, that, that often uh, uh, what municipalities want to do is they want to sustain uh, uh, what is frequently a very comfortable financial relationship between the municipalities and the cable operators. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, it's only through competition that we're going to see uh, prices and service uh, forced to, uh, to really attractive levels. I uh, thank you very much, Mr. Sykes. Thank you. Right. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Richardson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Sykes, uh, two questions relating to uh, concerns of city officials, uh, municipal authorities. Uh, first of all, a lot of the city officials, franchising authorities, claim that the technical standards uh, for cable systems are outdated, uh, second quality signals for consumers. Uh, my question is, are, are consumers getting the benefit of uh, new technology? Uh, shouldn't you be uh, revisiting technical standards? Let me, let me just give you the other one because the chairman has to enforce the time issue. Uh, the issue also of receiving antennas by municipal zoning ordinances. Uh, I think there's a view that a lot of uh, local governments uh, have been unreasonably regulating antenna, satellite dishes, other reception equipment. The FCC has a five-year policy that basically has been, uh, has been ignored. Uh, in other words, uh, to foster competition, uh, we have to enforce your five-year-old policy, which you reasserted in a letter to the Wall Street Journal, but somehow is, is not out there. Could you deal with those yeah. two, Chairman? Yeah, on, on the technical standards question, uh, we, we have been working uh, since the cable report uh, last, uh, last year on, uh, on uh, technical standards with the municipalities, the National Municipal League, League of Cities, and others, uh, 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 as well as the, uh, as the cable organizations. And we're anticipating uh, this spring a notice of proposed rulemaking uh, on the technical standards issue. Uh, now, with respect to the zoning issue, uh, you know, our authority, and I presume this goes to reception dishes, is that? Yeah. yeah. Our, our authority. Well, all kinds of equipment, it's not just those dishes. Well, I, 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 am, I am familiar with our authority as it relates to those dishes, and, and, and that is that we uh, uh, can preempt unreasonable zoning regulations. Uh, but essentially it says that the city can 
enact reasonable zoning regulations that we cannot preempt on the basis of aesthetics, health, or safety. And of course, for the, for the federal government to be coming in and, and, and judging uh, individual city zoning ordinances to determine whether there is a sufficient basis in health and aesthetics and safety uh, you know, for reasonableness, uh, I think would be quite difficult. Uh, although we do have a petition pending before us right now from Deerfield, New York, uh, where they say that, uh, that all remedies have been exhausted. I'm speaking to the petitioner, and, and we're taking a look at that situation. Uh, Chairman Sykes, uh, I'd like to ask uh, if you would consider that uh, the FCC include an access to programming provision or a non-discrimination in programming distribution provision as part of any rule uh, to be developed in your effective competition rulemaking because you've come out, uh, uh, there's, a, there's one pending before the Commission now in effective rulemaking, but there's no discussion on the issue of access to programming. Now, uh, your cable report talks about how there's got to be uh, all kinds of access to programming for DBS, wireless, et cetera, but there's nothing there. And my question is, would you consider uh, including a provision on access to programming? I think that'd be beyond uh, the, the purview of the effective competition docket. Uh, we have recommended, as you, uh, as you point out, uh, some program access uh, uh, you know, points uh, that, that we assume the Congress would take up you know, as it is in its legislation. But I think that would go beyond the purview of our effective competition docket, which is, uh, you know, uh, rather limited. I mean, it, it gets down to what is or isn't effective competition. I don't, I don't see why it would be outside your purview, even though I, I think you overdo your purview compared <laughs> to what we should do. Well, I'll certainly take, take that under advisement. Um, the definition of effective competition, uh, Chairman, would you say that there's a qualitative difference between uh, competition provided by six or more over-the-air broadcasters and competition provided by, say, multi-channel video operators? In other words, if six or more over-the-air channels provides effective competition, is there still a need in such markets for competition from DBS operators? MMDS operators, telcos? Yes, I think, I think multi-channel uh, providers uh, provide uh, qualitative differences. So, in essence, your, your answer is yes. Well, I, you know, you'd have to read back the question because I don't want to buy into too much, uh, Congressman, but uh, I, I think, I mean, I, you know, I think there can be effective competition potentially without a multi-channel provider in the market. But if the question is, does the multi-channel provider provide a qualitative uh, improvement, I think the answer is yes. Gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's I time it. has expired. I appreciate my colleague yielding his time. Uh, and uh, I'll recognize the gentleman from Alabama, but first make the notation that they, <clears throat> it's oftentimes said that the definition of an intelligent person is someone who can hold uh, a contradictory thought simultaneously within the, uh, the same mind. And, and I would have to note, uh, following up on the gentleman from the Mexico's uh, uh, question, that it is interesting that uh, for the purposes of establishing whether or not we should re-regulate uh, cable rates, uh, that uh, a large number of television stations serves as uh, effective competition within a marketplace. But for the purposes of whether or not we ought to have uh, permission granted to the telephone companies to enter in in order to uh, provide effective competition for the cable industry, that the fact that there are a large number of television stations within a marketplace does not serve as an effective bar to obviate the need for the telephone companies to be given that uh, new permission. And although it's a, uh, an incredible amount of respect which we all give to the, to the superior intellect of the chairman of the committee, of the commission, rather, and I, and I stand second to none in my admiration for his intellect, um, that uh, there are times when it's difficult for the rest of us to comprehend uh, the sophisticated argument which is made uh, on that subject. Let me turn and uh, recognize the gentleman from um, uh, Alabama, Mr. Harris.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sykes, you stated that action should be taken to prevent vertically integrated cable companies from driving uh, off competition. And, uh, and I would ask you, what action, for, for example, are, is your agency taking to ensure that cable companies do not overcharge satellite dish owners from, for access to their signals? We, we, have, we are just concluding uh, a study uh, specifically on uh, the question of discrimination. Uh, we'll be providing that report, uh, I would hope, within the next uh, 30 to 45 days. Uh, and we'll be uh, either uh, following up that with action you know, by the Commission or with specific recommendations uh, to the Congress. I'd say preliminarily uh, there, there is evidence that there is significant discrimination in, in some instances at least uh, between what uh, uh, a cable operator is charged and what uh, a home uh, uh, dish distributor is charged. Uh, and in some instances at least there, there seems in this, uh, in this preliminary evidence not to be uh, underlying justification for that price difference. I know I have a lot of rural area in my district, and uh, I've been in Congress going on five years. I've had more complaints about that uh, one particular thing, I guess, than anything dealing uh, with cable, in that uh, they just didn't understand how they could be charged more than the people that are actually online and uh, by the companies. Uh, and I guess to, to follow up, uh, Jim Cooper was asking you about it and a couple of others, but uh, I guess one, the biggest problem, uh, you may have competition in your urban areas, but in, in our, our rural areas, what, what uh, steps would you suggest or, or, or can we take to foster competition in rural areas? Well, it depends on how rural you're talking about. Uh, you know, Glasgow, Kentucky uh, would be defined by most people here in Washington as rural. Uh, That's but, a big town in my area. Yeah, I, you know, I grew up in a town of 18,000. It, uh, it's twice as big as uh, the town I grew up in. Uh, uh, I think probably in, 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 the, in the really small areas, uh, you know, that satellite uh, affords the uh, most significant potential. Uh, or as a fiber optic network is developed for uh, a variety of uses, I think that affords uh, significant potential, although I think that's further down the road. Mr. Chairman, I see my time is up, and I'll we'll let it. Thank you. I thank the, uh, the gentleman's time has expired. We welcome you to the wonderful world of cable, which uh, as a new member of the subcommittee, you'll, you'll come to love and enjoy as it uh, fully encompasses the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the entire uh, being of this subcommittee over the course of uh, <laughs> the next uh, several months. Uh, and uh, Mr. Chairman, we'll try, I will try to uh, honor your uh, request to um, be out of here by uh, 10 minutes of one. And, and uh, uh, I'll just ask a couple of uh, questions myself, and uh, and then we'll complete the uh, the hearing. Um, speaking, Mr. Chairman, at the uh, National Cable Television Association convention last year, you stated, and I quote: "You cannot expect government to continue sanctioning, indeed protecting and promoting cable as a sole source provider of video services." while at the same time foregoing the regulation that historically has been placed on monopoly operations. The American people, in short, will not tolerate an unregulated monopoly indefinitely. Now, since you spoke last year at the National Cable Convention, rates have continued to increase at twice the rate of inflation for other uh, uh, products, consumer goods across the country. Uh, presently, as we've noted before, the FCC is in the process of redefining effective uh, competition. My first question to you is, will the Commission's rulemaking on effective competition address the concerns in your speech last year by promoting the development of robust competition? I, I don't think our effective competition rulemaking will promote the development of robust competition. It will not? No, I don't think it will. I mean, I can't imagine that it uh, is going to have that effect. So, 
But although you are in a, in a rulemaking on effective competition, um, your concession that it will not, in fact, promote new competition, um, but rather redefine, in fact, what the state of competition is in the marketplace, um, leads us to the problem that, as you know, the bad actors or the renegade uh, cable uh, operators um, still will not have any kind of regulatory regime which is imposed upon them in order to ensure uh, that uh, they cannot gouge uh, at twice or, or, or three times or four times in some instances the rate of inflation, the consumers of cable systems out there who are a, a consumer of uh, cable uh, programming out there in the, uh, in the country. Um, so my, my question to you would be what what do, we, what do we say to those people? Uh, what, what relief do we promise to them? Are, are they just left over here as uh, some kind of uh, uh, economic uh, modeling anomaly that, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the government cannot uh, properly uh, provide adequate <coughs> protection for? If they, were, if they were, in my view, a natural monopoly, uh, I would not hesitate to suggest as my speech to NCTA uh, uh, indicates uh, that there be some sort of rate uh, regulation regime. <clears throat> I don't perceive them as a natural monopoly. I think your question then would come to uh, what about the interim? In other words, you know, theoretical competition doesn't uh, have a lot of force on prices. Real competition does. Uh, I think that the interim would be very short. And I guess I would have to fall back on Congressman Bryant's uh, observation that, uh, that we're not dealing with water or electricity or gas, that in fact from time to time turning the television set off and talking to people and reading books and what have you is not a bad alternative. I agree with that 100 um, it, percent. It's, it's an excellent thing to do and my, my wife has suggested that to me throughout the entire NCAA playoffs. But uh, nonetheless, I, I, I personally would prefer, in making my own selection, some people would prefer at certain times not to read a book and, in fact, watch uh, their, uh, their uh, television set uh, plugged into their cable outlet for better um, uh, reception and uh, higher quality programming uh, to avoid themselves of this technological revolution that largely was fueled by laws that we passed here out of this committee uh, mandating access to television programming for, without charge for the cable systems, uh, making the telephone and electrical outlets uh, available to the cable systems to have this technology there. So at the same time, while I believe that it might be good occasionally for people to talk to their families rather than watching television after supper, uh, that far be it for me to impose that upon them. And as a result, our committee exists. And it is to provide them with other options. Uh, and sometimes I find that domestic tranquility can be advanced by the fact that everyone is watching television and they're talking to themselves. <laughs> so um, uh, it's, it's helpful sometimes to be married to a psychiatrist. You realize that not all problems can be treated with the same. Uh, and so I would hope that you would, um, uh, would then uh, help us in, in advancing a more complex agenda than perhaps some want. And, uh, and I would reflect upon your, um, your comment that we do need uh, a competition. And I would then ask then uh, whether or not, uh, in conclusion, you believe that it's important that Congress must legislate, must legislate this year uh, to spur the development of a truly competitive um, cable marketplace. I think it would be helpful, yes. Now, I, I mean, that, I would like to choose how you legislate, but I do think that there are particular uh, uh, laws that would clearly advance it, uh, dealing with the franchise, dealing with program access. So you, you do believe that legislation is needed this year? in the area of uh, cable competition? In the area of, of, uh, of uh, providing more uh, competitive options, yes. OK, good. That's very helpful, because we do intend on moving, as you can imagine, um, in that area. And we will want to uh, work with uh, you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, in order to, and the rest of the commission, in order to uh, develop that uh, legislation. Um, again, my preference would be, if I might uh, stipulate this, that uh, we do develop the legislation in a bipartisan uh, fashion, that we deal with an interim uh, regulatory regime at the same time that we're putting on the books the, the uh, incentives for the development of a competitive, of other means by which consumers can get access uh, to programming. 
And uh, the more competitive a marketplace becomes, the less need there is for regulation, the less need, less need there is for the government to be in the business of telling anybody how much they should pay because they can go to another source. Right now, for most of the country, that's not a real uh, option. So um, my, uh, my goal here is to legislate in the same fashion that we have in past years, including uh, the cable bill last year, uh, to reach a bipartisan consensus to pass it unanimously. If we cannot do that, I am not uh, at all uh, inimical to the uh, concept of, uh, of moving forward with uh, tough votes that have to be cast. I don't think that's a good way to legislate in this very sophisticated, very complex area of telecommunications policy, uh, but I don't foreclose that option. Uh, in order to uh, avoid it, however, we're going to have to work with you and, and the respect which we have uh, for uh, you is uh, very high on this subcommittee, and, uh, and we hope that in the course of this year now, as we move forward, um, we, uh, we can uh, work with you effectively. Okay. Um, I might note that uh, although the Senate and the House uh, have their own uh, individual personalities and procedures by which uh, legislation is finally passed uh, on the floor by the body, um, that uh, it seems to me the will is there on both sides uh, to uh, deal with the issue uh, this year. And uh, that being the, the case, I think that uh, uh, it's in all of our mutual uh, interest uh, to work together. Um, let me, before I close, just uh, without objection, enter um, the, uh, the, the documents which Mr. Cooper wanted to have entered into the record. And without objections, uh, that, will, um, that will be the case. We'll also leave this record open for a few more days for other members who would like to uh, introduce uh, documents into the record. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Stewart, we very much appreciate your uh, cooperation. I think we've come pretty close to uh, uh, abiding by your time deadlines. And uh, again, we want to work closely with you in the course of the year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to get out here. For more information about this hearing and others that are scheduled, you may contact the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance at 316 Annex 2 in Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20515. Coming up shortly, an interview with the Executive Director of the National Commission for Employer Support of the Guard and Reserve. Recently, C-SPAN's Viewer Information Department received these letters regarding our call-in programs. I am amazed with the ingenuity of anyone who gets through to express their...